In the late 1920s, the prospect of a Hillsborough High student enrolling in college was bleak. The nation was in the throes of the Great Depression. Businesses were failing, and many of Tampa's beautiful waterfront homes were left abandoned. The principal at Hillsborough High, Frederick Spaulding, didn't see these barriers. He only saw bright young students who were in need of a place to continue their learning. In 1931, collegiate-level courses were offered at Hillsborough High. This would later become the University of Tampa. On August 2, 1933, Spaulding arrived at the doors of Plant Hall with a 100-year lease from the city and a firm resolve, and with the turn of a key, opened the door to the University of Tampa. In its fledgling years, UT was fortunate if it could collect half of the tuition due from its students. It was only through the dedication of its professors, who worked without pay, that the university survived the Great Depression. Over the next several decades, UT grew slightly, enrolling up to 1,800 at times, starting several sports teams, and even began accepting students from other areas of the country. But in the early 90s, the growth seemed to stand still, even stop. UT needed new life, some passion. UT needed strong leadership. In 1995, Dr. Vaughn became president and UT began to transform. A thousand UT students has become 7,200 and we are now entering our 17th consecutive year of record enrollment. All the while, UT's academic profile continues to increase. There has been $350 million in new construction since 2000. We have added seven new residence halls, academic buildings and labs, as well as athletic facilities. Plant Hall even got new carpet and new windows. UT now has more than 3,000 events annually and 200 clubs and student organizations. We have won 13 NCAA Division II championships, and since 2000, Spartan teams have won 35 Sunshine State Conference titles. As a member of the University of Tampa Spartan family, you are a guiding force behind UT's remarkable success. We are alums, students, parents, and friends, and together we are changing lives. We are individuals, yet the greater whole is only complete when we work together. You have helped make UT a vibrant community with growing resources and a superior reputation. Just like in the beginning when professors worked without pay, the spirit of giving at UT remains strong. Last year, nearly $14 million was donated to the university by thousands of generous supporters. When we strengthen education, we strengthen our job force and our nation as a whole. Donations support academics, campus life, and a student's ability to afford an education. Your participation is what matters most and shows that our Spartan family believes in the future. This is the University of Tampa. UT students travel from across the nation and around the globe to join a dynamic learning community. There are 150 academic programs, continuing studies for non-traditional students, and a highly ranked graduate school.
The UT experience begins with an innovative first year program and continues with opportunities to challenge yourself in the honors program, to study abroad, to conduct research with faculty, to do an internship, to volunteer in the community, or to participate in multiple leadership programs. Explore your dreams, discover your talents, get ready to invent, innovate, and be a leader. This is the University of Tampa. UT's newest facility is the Innovation and Collaboration Building. Here you will find UT's very own Starbucks. In addition, classrooms, cybersecurity labs, study lounges, and the Loth Entrepreneurship Center designed for student entrepreneurs to launch their startups. Thanks for joining me today.
In the late 1920s, the prospect of a Hillsborough High student enrolling in college was bleak. The nation was in the throes of the Great Depression. Businesses were failing, and many of Tampa's beautiful waterfront homes were left abandoned. The principal at Hillsborough High, Frederick Spaulding, didn't see these barriers. He only saw bright young students who were in need of a place to continue their learning. In 1931, collegiate-level courses were offered at Hillsborough High. This would later become the University of Tampa. On August 2, 1933, Spaulding arrived at the doors of Plant Hall with a 100-year lease from the city and a firm resolve, and with the turn of a key, opened the door to the University of Tampa. In its fledgling years, UT was fortunate if it could collect half of the tuition due from its students. It was only through the dedication of its professors, who worked without pay, that the university survived the Great Depression. Over the next several decades, UT grew slightly, enrolling up to 1,800 at times, starting several sports teams, and even began accepting students from other areas of the country. But in the early 90s, the growth seemed to stand still, even stop. UT needed new life, some passion. UT needed strong leadership. In 1995, Dr. Vaughn became president, and UT began to transform. A thousand UT students has become 7,200, and we are now entering our 17th consecutive year of record enrollment. All the while, UT's academic profile continues to increase. There has been $350 million in new construction since 2000. We have added seven new residence halls, academic buildings and labs, as well as athletic facilities. Plant Hall even got new carpet and new windows. UT now has more than 3,000 events annually and 200 clubs and student organizations. We have won 13 NCAA Division II championships, and since 2000, Spartan teams have won 35 Sunshine State Conference titles. As a member of the University of Tampa Spartan family, you are a guiding force behind UT's remarkable success. We are alums, students, parents, and friends, and together we are changing lives. We are individuals, Yet the greater whole is only complete when we work together. You have helped make UT a vibrant community with growing resources and a superior reputation. Just like in the beginning when professors worked without pay, the spirit of giving at UT remains strong. Last year, nearly $14 million was donated to the university by thousands of generous supporters. When we strengthen education, we strengthen our job force and our nation as a whole. Donations support academics, campus life, and a student's ability to afford an education. Your participation is what matters most and shows that our Spartan family believes in the future of UT. Whatever level of support, your gift is important to us and enables UT to provide the challenging, high quality education that has defined our university. Thank you for helping UT achieve such great success.
This is the University of Tampa. Explore your dreams. Discover your talents. Get ready to invent, innovate, and be a leader. This is the University of Tampa. In the late 1920s, the prospect of a Hillsborough High student enrolling in college was bleak. The nation was in the throes of the Great Depression. Businesses were failing, and many of Tampa's beautiful waterfront homes were left abandoned. The principal at Hillsborough High, Frederick Spaulding, didn't see these barriers. He only saw bright young students who were in need of a place to continue their learning. In 1931, collegiate-level courses were offered at Hillsborough High. This would later become the University of Tampa. On August 2, 1933, Spaulding arrived at the doors of Plant Hall with a hundred-year lease from the city and a firm resolve, and with the turn of a key, opened the door to the University of Tampa. In its fledgling years, UT was fortunate if it could collect half of the tuition due from its students. It was only through the dedication of its professors, who worked without pay, that the university survived the Great Depression. Over the next several decades, UT grew slightly enrolling up to 1,800 at times, starting several sports teams, and even began accepting students from other areas of the country. But in the early 90s, the growth seemed to stand still, even stop. UT needed new life, some passion. UT needed strong leadership. In 1995, Dr. Vaughn became president, and UT began to transform. A 1,000 UT students has become 7,200, and we are now entering our 17th consecutive year of record enrollment. All the while, UT's academic profile continues to increase. There has been $350 million in new construction since 2000. We have added seven new residence halls, academic buildings and labs, as well as athletic facilities. Plant Hall even got new carpet and new windows. UT now has more than 3,000 events annually and 200 clubs and student organizations. We have won 13 NCAA Division II championships, and since 2000, Spartan teams have won 35 Sunshine State Conference titles. As a member of the University of Tampa Spartan family, you are a guiding force behind UT's remarkable success. We are alums, students, parents, and friends, and together we are changing lives. We are individuals, yet the greater whole is only complete when we work together. You have helped make UT a vibrant community with growing resources and a superior reputation. Just like in the beginning when professors worked without pay, the spirit of giving at UT remains strong. Last year, nearly $14 million was donated to the university by thousands of generous supporters. When we strengthen education, we strengthen our job force and our nation as a whole. Donations support academics, campus life, and a student's ability to afford an education. Your participation is what matters most and shows that our Spartan family believes in the future of UT. Whatever level of support, your gift is important to us and enables UT to provide the challenging, high-quality education that has defined our university. Thank you for helping UT achieve such great success.
evening, folks. Wherever you're from, if you're live or if you're watching from your home, this is Tampa Spartans TV. Thank you for joining in. We have the Tampa Spartans here today against the Davenport University Panthers. I'm Brandon Davis alongside Taylor Stolesworthy. It's a calm, it's a nice 74 degrees out today. If, nice breeze if you're here today. We have the Tampa Spartans coming off that 8-2 victory against the the Palm Beach Atlantic Sailfish, a very, very eventful game that if you guys were watching that one, it was away at West Palm Beach, Taylor. I know we want to get into it, but the key highlight was Santiago Garavito on that routine, uh, he had a routine infield, pop fly, and he went to first base and he actually did an A-Rod. He actually nudged the first baseman and, you know, we're going to get that into, into that briefly, but what are your thoughts about that when he got into the altercation? There was a couple on uh, base collisions earlier this season. We know that Jamarcus Lyons had a collision with a Quincy College player. That one didn't end in anything drama, but unfortunately it did take Lyons out of action for the weekend. Garavito and the first baseman wasn't the only Spartan to get involved. Earlier I heard there had been a collision with Jordan Lala and mm. uh, Palm Beach's first baseman, but Spartans were able to have a clear base path the earlier parts of the weekend, and it continued on their way to a weekend victory and a weekend sweep, as you mentioned, the 8-1 victory last time for the Spartans. It has brought them to a record of 10-2. and 10-2. Now, they're going to be facing off against Davenport. The Panthers coming off a heartbreaker, 11-12 loss as part of a series and doubleheader against Tiffin. They're 3-5 and five for this year's campaign. Let's get into the starting lineup real quick for the Tampa Spartans. We have EJ Cumble at right field, number one, right leading off. Drew Earhart, number two. J.D. Urso, number three. We have Nunez at number four. Daskow at number five. We have Hunt, number six. Gutcher, number seven. Saladino, number eight. Cadenas, number nine. And Poco at the tenth. He is pitching tonight. And then while we have the Davenport Panthers, they will be leading off at the top of the first. We have Valone starting at one. We have Rubner at the two lineup. Mets, three. Showers, Robinson, Tronson, Chavado, Marsher, Hylak, and Fisher for the pa Panthers as we go for the first pitch. It is high and outside for ball one. Yeah, as we just mentioned, Valone, he's going to be leading off for the Panthers. And he's going to take another pitch outside. Ball two. Ashton Polko will take the mound for the Spartans behind the plate. Gutcher forming the battery. And we'll see if the Spartans can continue. The good times that had started last weekend over at Palm Beach. This one's popped up. It should be in play unless it's going to be a victim of the fence. Yes, it will be a victim of the fence. Two and one. Yeah, you mentioned that. You want to pull some stats up for Valone his last game. Yep, Valone. That crucial loss at 11 to 12. Unfortunate loss for Davenport as they begin their campaign in the Great Lakes Intercollegiate Athletic Conference. But Valone for the season, hitting 294. He's going to watch a break is. into the 300 today. He might just be able to do that. No, he won't. It had a bit of carry, but in the end, it'll be a routine fly ball to Saladino out and left, one away. Now we have Drew Earhart, I mean, excuse me. Now we have Rubner. Rubner, number two. He is up for the first night, day of the night. He will be up to the batter's box. Poco getting his second at bat batter here. First pitch is away and outside for ball one. So Danny Gutcher, I think, was hoping to get that to be strike one, but it did just miss. Coltrane Rubner who we just mentioned was at the plate, or is at the plate, hitting 333 for the season. He's going to take this one. It will be called for strike one. It's an excellent, excellent batting average so far in the season. The Panthers 3-5 and five in the season. Really want to get that fourth win here. Grounder. Poco has it. Right to Daskow and one away. Nice little play there. Polko making a good grab. And a light stole flip to Doskow. No big issues there. It's a routine grounder, but I'll say Rumner had a nice little burst of speed in the base paths. And he's able to get there safe. And he's not able to get there safely. So now we have Ben Metz up, the senior, six foot out of Macomb, Michigan. He'll take the first pitch. Ball. 
I'll say Mets is probably the bat that Coach Urso is the most wary of. He leads the Panthers with a 438 average this season mm. and already has an eye-opening 1307 OPS that leads the team by nearly 400 points in that category. And if you're not a big savant of baseball stats back at home, 1305 is very, very, very good. That's a well number said. rivaling Barry Bonds in one of the greatest MLB seasons of all time. Of course, you can get those numbers early on in a campaign. The hard part will be keeping that number throughout the rest of the season. Count is 2-1 and one now. 3-1, this one just missed. 3-1. We'll see if Mets can get on board to keep the inning alive. No, not yet. That one's down in the middle. Strike two. Poco, full count. Grounder, base hit. As a, you see the shift that the second baseman had. He, he wasn't there. Dasco, he moved away, expecting the second baseman to be there. But nevertheless, the first base hit of the night for the Panthers and for both teams. He gets the first hit on the scoreboard. Now we have Kale Showers up. Yeah, I'll say with a, with a pretty aggressive shift, normally you'll have a second baseman or a player there to pick that up and make the play. However... Spartan shifted a little over to the uh, left, trying to make sure Mets didn't pull one down the left field line, and that unfortunately allowed the wide open hole between Doskow and Earhart to fit the ball through, giving Mets the single, although it was a slow enough grounder that Kumbo was able to get on top of it before Mets had any dream of going to second base. Big whiff by Showers, and the count goes to one and one. The 1-1. One, one. Pop fly. Shallow right. Combo is there. And he will get the catch to end the inning for the Spartans. So one hit, one man left on base. No runs, no errors. We'll be back in the bottom of the first. You're watching TampaSpartans.tv. communication there because I did not know. There we go. Welcome back folks to TampaSpawns.tv. The score is now still 0-0. We have the Tampa Spawns lined up to bat for the first time of the night. Here we are on the bottom of the second. Fisher getting some mound routine repetitions right here. He's ready to go. He's warming up. We start off with EJ Combo. EJ Combo, last week in the previous series, he was down to number nine, or excuse me, number seven in the batting lineup. Now it's going to be brought up by Coach Urso to start off. As we knew that Drew Earhart was usually the leadoff hitter, but now we have EJ Combo, who has been lights out, lights out the past few games. Tampa Spartans, their last two series, sweeping both series, Maryville and Palm Beach Atlantic, and now they enter this quick home stretch against Davenport. Panthers, here's the first pitch. High and outside, ball one. I know you mentioned EJ Combo taking uh, the leadoff spot. I think one of the reasons he's shuffling down the order is when he's facing a lefty. Coach are so wary of the platoon, but obviously facing a righty, he trusts him to lead off. Line drive, base hit. A good rip by EJ Combo to set the tone for the Spartans. That's exactly what the Spartans need, just a quick base hit to lead off the game. 
And that'll put Drew Earhart up in a very good spot as the Spartans try to strike early. Drew Earhart, a Tampa native, attended Wharton High School. 5'11", 195 pounds. Very lean, very fast. You know he has some base stealing ability. EJ Combo at first. There's Fisher looking at him. Combo goes, but it is a foul. He will go back. As I think a good idea to try to get Gumbo or Combo active on the base paths quickly, but ultimately he was a foul ball, so they might have to try again. But I do wonder if Fisher is now going to have his eye a little more on Combo over at the first base. The 0-1. Outside ball one. So one on one count here. Earhart in the last game, two for four, earned run that had an RBI. So he had a great, great outing in his last game. Single down the left field line to score in Jordan Lala against the Palm Beach Atlantic. Selfish. The one one. Low. Two and one. Kind of ironic. He's number two, number two Derek Jeter, number two in the lineup. You know, yeah. It's poetic. Also has a two-one count right two now. Two-one count. Yep. And Taylor, as Fisher checks combo, want to get in a quick segue about that that shift in the last inning. Me and Jack were talking about this, uh, I believe, a week and a half ago about the new MLB rules and in, uh, in, in instituting the shift, and now having the fans not really wanting that because. They want more hits, and they want a more fair gameplay. What are your thoughts about that as Fisher checks combo I, again? What are your thoughts about that? I personally like it because I think it's kind of goofy when you see six players on one side of the field just waiting for a ball to go that way. Having a, You can still shift relatively well without having to put 20 people on one side of the field. As we see right here, we have the Spartans infield a little more biased to the left side to watch out as the right-handed hitter, Air, or well, not the Spartans infield, the Panthers infield, shifted a little bit to the left, watching out for Earhart to pull the ball to left. And I like it because you're allowing a more natural flow of the game. You're not putting a second baseman out in the outfield, where I think it's good because, as well, that's what they used to do in the past. They didn't... Combo goes, and he got him. He is out at second. What a throw. What a throw. Heilick behind home yeah. plate. A cannon. From Heilick. Wow. Whew. I gotta give you gotta give credit when credit's due. Had perfect timing on that. I believe Combo had a good jump, but I think he kinda hesitated a little bit to be honest. But nevertheless, full count here for Earhart. One out, first out of the inning. Pop fly. Shallow left. And he puts him away. That's a great recovery for Fisher and for the Panthers. They were able to get back in the battle against Erhard, and they were able to get Combo stealing. Combo had a great jump, but and it looked like he was going to beat the throw. Mosher wasn't back in position, but the throw was just good enough to beat him by about a step or so and make that a pretty easy call out for Gary Glover. And by the way, Gary Glover, he's the infield umpire. Roberto Knox Reyes, the home plate umpire. So here we, now we have J.D. Urso grounds it foul. Urso's last game against the Selfish, two for four, two RBIs. He was a very, very prominent component for the Spartans' last game series. I'll also say that Urso had a slower start in the first couple series, but he's been really speeding up and already is just a few points behind Doskow in most categories to lead the team uh, stats-wise. Enters the game with a 391 average. 15 RBIs, he leads the team with that. A 739 slugging and 483 on base percentage. Ooh, wow pitch, grounder. Yeah, but Urso, that last game, two run home run. Scored Saladino to put up the Spartans the 4 1 in the top of the fifth. It was a very, very crucial turning point for the Spartans that last game. And he seems to try to get something going here for the Spartans again. 2-1. Right down the middle. 2-2. Two two. 
Urso hit his first home run of the season during the home series against Maryville last weekend. Deep to left. Deep to left. A moonshot, if you will. It was a great way for the Spartans to capitalize and cap off a series sweep as they carry a six-game winning streak into tonight's opener against Davenport. Of course, by opener, it is also the only game of this one-game stretch on Monday. They will be on the road at Mississippi College next weekend, which will be fun. And fun fact, first time Spartans and Panthers have ever faced off. Interesting. And the last time I was at Davenport, it was, it was before COVID, and now the Tampa Spartans are get, they're facing Davenport. So this is the first time I ever heard about Davenport in four years. So the Davenport Panthers are against the Spartans. Full count, base hit up the middle for J.D. Urso. And he gets it going for the Spartans. His first hit of the night. Anthony Nunez up. The 6'2 third baseman. Yeah, so Nunez will be at the plate here. And Nunez will have the runner on. We'll see what the lefty third baseman can do. He's currently hitting 383 this season. Having a good start. Count strike all one. Nunez's last outing, in his last game, he actually went one for three. Excuse me, 0 for three. But he got on base through a walk and he actually scored. So he was definitely one of the contributors in the last game as he takes the 0 1. Urso. Fisher checking Urso. And I'll definitely say, Fisher has definitely kept his eye on first base after we saw Combo try multiple times to steal. I think that's just making sure that Fisher and Davenport, they're wary because the Spartans are a team that can capitalize on the base paths. Even though we will actually not see Jordan Lala in the lineup tonight. The Urso goes, here's the throw, and he beats it. A good jump by Heidelak, but better offense by J.D. Urso. Good jump by him. And I actually had first-class access by his father, uh, Coach Joe Urso, when I was doing my project for school. Um, shout out to UTTV. And I actually had first-class access to B-roll, and, and they were actually doing a lot of defensive transitioning, base running drills. You know, we all know in baseball that's usually the start of the practice, but they were really intensifying uh, the pace and just trying to get the timing going with the cones and so it's definitely a testimony to what Coach, o Coach, Coach Urso and the assistant coaches are implementing in, the, in these players as Nunez takes a 1-2 count but yeah back to what I'm saying just a quick soliloquy about what's going on with the Tampa Spartans and their practices and how it translates to the games low outside 2-2 two and two count here and getting back to what you were mentioning about the fielding drills and base running drills, come postseason time, which is always going to be a big end of your thing, you have to have your team ready. Small ball is a way that you can win. You have to make sure you're avoiding errors on the base path or in the field. That's why you're practicing it, because practicing makes permanent. Foul away. Yeah, and I was covering softball the, the other weekend with Bruce, and the t uh, PBA Selfish, uh, the women's softball team, they had five errors in one inning and it cost them the game and that's just what you were saying basically it kind of supports your claim about how you need to practice this stuff in practice it's all about mentality i think softball is also a completely different beast of a sport when it comes to fielding because you have the larger ball you have a shorter look distance in. and the spartans go down looking when one man left on base but nevertheless one hit but no runs earned. We go to the top of the second here. Thank you guys for watching TampaSportons.tv.
Welcome back to TV. We are here in the top of the second. Still no runs earned for both teams, but we have two runs from the Tampa Spartans and one run, I mean, excuse me, two hits for the Tampa Spartans, one hit from the Panthers. Both good pitching so far from, so far from Hoko and, and Fisher, but now we have the Panthers up in the top of the second. Have... It will be Robinson. Robinson up. The junior. Left-handed hitter as he takes a ball outside. Robinson's DHing today. So we'll see if that can change any factors later in this game. Poco. Line drive. Base hit up the middle. And Poco will go to first. That's a very much needed hit for Robinson. Entered the game one for 15. But he's going to be able to find the middle of the field with a sharp grounder. And that's the second hit of the campaign to bring up Tronson. And now we have Tronson up. Tronson, the first baseman. I'll say Tronson, even though his batting average isn't one of the highest on the team, he actually does carry the second highest slugging percentage for the Panthers at 546. So definitely be wary of any balls into the gaps. Spartans will need to be alert in the outfield. Indeed, they need to. The 1 0. High. 2 and 0. Yeah, Tronson, 6 2. But he looks 6 4 to me in my eyes. But nevertheless, this, the outfit should definitely, definitely be wary. The runner goes. Foul tip, though. You always have to be careful in a hit and run situation because if there's a little pop up that goes foul, the runner that just stole has to make it all the way back in time because that's an easy way to get doubled up. I know that's how one of the games against uh, Quincy College, or no, Georgia College ended, where the Spartans were able to force a double play on a line drive when runners were moving. Grounder, Urso, oh, fumbles it, but he gets to the first at the end time. Yes, he is. The crowd is in distraught, but. Nevertheless, I think the umpire had the right call on that one as Dasco just got it through. I mean, excuse me, Urso got it to Dasco for the 6 3. So one out on the, one out so far now. I'll say it's very close. It looked like Urso was almost going to be able to come up with a catch initially, but it gets away from him. Looks to second, and I think be, maybe by half a step or even less, is able to beat the runner at first. So it works as an effective sacrifice on a fielder's choice. Trav Devereau takes the first strike. These Panthers, they have a lot of height on them, I would say. I would say the average height is about 6'1", 6'2". Ooh, curveball foul tipped. That's the goal sometimes. You have a lot of height that might be able to give you extra power. For Shadara of this season, hasn't helped them that much in that category, but he has driven in five RBIs so far. And he's doing a good job of getting on base, even though he does have 11 strikeouts compared to just five walks. Interesting. Swing and a miss. Strike oh. three for Sh Sh Shadorov. Make that 12 strikeouts on the season as Polkel gets his first to the game. It's interesting that you actually implemented, you, in, you, uh, you introduced that right as he swung and missed. It was perfect timing. I, mean, I, I thought you wouldn't have jinxed it, to be honest, Taylor. <laughs> well, that's a jinx I'll very much take uh, from the commentary booth. As Mosher steps up with two away. And will he give Davenport the lead? And that's how they close out the inning for the Spartans. So, two men are left on base. No hits and no runs. And we go to the bottom of the second. Thank you guys for watching TampaSpartans.tv. Champions know how to seize opportunities. When they see moments of greatness unfold right before their eyes, they push as hard as they possibly can. And then they push harder. Because the heart of a champion never settles, never quits, and never stops giving its all. We are champions. We are Division II. We go big, we give it everything we've got, and we win. On the field, on our campuses, in our communities, for our causes, in our careers. We rise to become champions in everything we do. We are Division II and there are no limits here. We make our time count. We set our own path. We become champions on our terms. 
It's time to up your game because we're here to play and learn. But most importantly, we're here to discover ourselves, our vision, our heart, our drive to achieve every goal we aim for because we want to be champions at the highest level, life. At Division II, the opportunities are here. Are you ready? Welcome back to TampaSpawns.tv. We have a very eventful, eventful game so far. Score is still zero, but we're here in the top, bottom of the second as Dasko comes up. EJ Dasko, the first baseman. And I'll say, Brandon, the Valdosta State transfer has had a great start to the season. Three home runs, leads the team with a 4.55 average, 8.18 slugging percentage, and 500 on base percentage. Very, very good statistics that you just announced, Taylor. First pitch is inside for a call, cool ball one. And Dasko, his last outing with the temp, I mean, excuse me, the Palm Beach Atlantic Sailfish. One for four, but nevertheless had two RBIs in his last at bat. Ball, oh, excuse me, strike, so count for one and one. Evidently, the bases were loaded and he walked, and that's how he got the RBI in the last outing. Grounder, base hit right past the third baseman. And Doskow stopping, trying to go to second, but nevertheless, he stays at first. Great, great timing and great cut from EJ Doskow. Yeah, that's exactly what you want. Just a hard hit ground ball, and even though there was a great attempt over at third by Showers, he wasn't going to be able to come away with that. So it is a leadoff single. And by the way, a reminder of the Panthers infield. Showers is at third, Mets is at short, Moshers at second, and Tronson is at first base, who's going to be holding Dosko there. But I don't think Dosko is going to make a steal attempt uh, during this at bat. He's not as agile on the base paths as a Jordan Lalo or J.D. Urso. But maybe because of that, he's a little more successful. Catches them off guard. Hunt takes the first pitch ball outside for count 1-0. The 1 0. Foul tipped. 1 0 1. The 6 4 sophomore takes the 1 1. Outside. I believe that was a curveball for a count two and one. Oh, and that's it. Deep to right. But nevertheless, Valone is there to get that out. Dasko goes back to first. That's what he probably thought was a bit, maybe a home run or a warning track hit. But he gets the out. A beautiful play by Valone. But I, I really thought, in my opinion, he had, to, he had to cut. It was right on the sweet spot. But just not enough to get over the edge. I'll say from this angle, it certainly looked like that was going to leave the park. That was a beautifully hit fly ball. But just not enough distance as Valone was able to eventually get under it to bring up Gutcher with one away. Danny Gutcher. Sophomore. He takes the first pitch high for count 1 0. Gutcher in his last outing. 1 for 4 with a hit. Gutcher averaging 269 for the season. He's played 8 games and recorded 7 hits in 26 at bats. That's a good start, and he's been running back and forth, uh, usually off the bench for Garavito. But he's also got a good arm behind home plate, allowing him to be a very good option for Urso to frequently rotate into the lineup. Normally, when Gutcher would start a catcher, we would see Garavito at the DH spot, but they're going to give him a rest today, 
And I'd say very well deserved because Garavito's had a great season so far. Might as well give him a chance to kick back and relax in the dugout. Grounder right to Tronson. And they get the double play at second. A beautiful outing to close the inning from Tronson and Mets. So that would be a three, I believe a three, six double play to end the inning. We go to the top of the third here. Still no runs on the scoreboard. Thank you guys for joining Tampa Spartans.tv. I pledge. I pledge. I pledge. I pledge. I am an NCAA student athlete. And I pledge to be a champion of unity on my team, on my campus, and in my community. I pledge to embrace differences and strive for inclusion and collaboration. I pledge to stand against racism, hate, and discrimination. I pledge to strive for love, care, and forgiveness. I pledge to stand against silence, deceit, and obscurity. I pledge to strive for dialogue, truth, and understanding. I pledge to stand against fear and doubt. I pledge to strive for trust and belief in one another. I pledge to stand against complacency and stagnancy. I pledge to strive for change and growth. I commit to supporting my fellow student athletes in all circumstances that impact them. I commit to both choosing unity personally and encouraging it for all. I pledge these things because we are stronger together. United, United as, as one. one. Welcome back here to the top of the third inning. Still no run scored if you guys are just joining us on TampaSpartans.tv. The 10-2 and two Spartans now are on defense against the 3-5 and five, Davenport Panthers. We have Heilick at the bottom of the lineup, number nine in the lineup. Heilick, the catcher, he will be up. Valone will be next to take it at the start of the lineup. And then Rubner will be after that. But so far, what are your thoughts about what's going on in this game? I, I think it's very good pitching. I would say the all speed pitches, a lot of a lot of the batters are getting a good jump cut on that one, and that's what, you, what you're seeing for the right-handed batters. They're hitting it to the left side, and for the um, for the left-handed batters, they're hitting it right down the middle, so right up the right up the middle. So, what are your thoughts about the off-speed pitches and just the pitching in, in, in total? What, what are your thoughts, real quick? Yeah, I definitely think Fisher and Polko have had good starts to the game, but the defense has also been very good, especially for Davenport. They've cut down multiple base runners, and recently we saw them turn to three-six double play on a very unlucky grounder from Danny Gutcher, and. We'll We'll see if the Spartans can also continue their good fielding luck as we store in a deadlock pretty early here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as Highlight grounds it, foul. For the so now he gets the 0-1. Swing and a miss, count 0-2. Fool him that time with the off speed, getting him to bite all the way down to the dirt. His head, well, did, not turn out. Yeah. <laughs> His head didn't turn out, though, so that was a good thing. 0-2, almost wild pitch, but good, good job from Gutcher to recover that count one and two usually on plays like that you'll see a lot of dust get kicked up and that's when the uniforms start to get a little dirtier <laughs> but thanks to turf they'll stay relatively swing clean. and the miss ball goes wild gutcher can he get it but dasco has to get off base so gutcher will be safe and he will get on base so yeah. unfortunate circumstances there sequence of events but now the panthers have something going here as they have one runner on base and we have the top of the lineup now as Valone. So Valone will be up. He recently flew out to left field. That one took a weird bounce away from Guthrie. He did a good job to get back to it, but Hylick was safe by probably a quarter of a mile there he would have been on the eventual regardless. throw. Because yeah. even though the throw did miss Dosko, his good reaction by Gutcher to make sure the would-be base dealer went back immediately. No shot there of uh, getting it in time. So good to Dosko to make sure it didn't get further away. The 1-0. Grounder. Earhart. Urso. Dasko for the 4-6-3 double play as the Panthers go down in two. And that's the perfect at bat for Polkel. In the second pitch, he's able to find the grounder right to Earhart and then smooth as butter to Urso to Dasko. This infield is very, very strong. As I already told you, I already saw these people, these, these players practice, and they just practice at a fast, quick rate and no mistakes at all. Not to be biased here, but Taylor, but it's true. I mean, we're Tampa Spartans TV. We can be a little <laughs> bit biased. But also, you know, I have to mention, of course, we got some very good infield depth and veteran depth on that right side. The graduate Dosco, graduate Earhart. 
Third season, even though he's only a sophomore eligibility wise for mm-hmm. Urso, two time freshman of the year, which um you don't normally see uh, someone win freshman of the year twice. Exactly. That's thanks to all the COVID uh, red shirts and regulations. The one one to Rubner. Inside, he kind of cuts back, but now he faces one two. Poco, the one two. Breaking ball, excuse me, off speed pitch, two and two. Well, you mentioned like off speeds and breaking balls. They're relatively the same thing. Yeah, Even though same. you might have a changeup or a splitter that breaks a little less, they do eventually break quite a bit. As ooh, this one, inside. oof, Tampa was ready to get back to the dugout. But you know what pitch I'm not seeing no more, really, Taylor? The cutter. I'm not seeing that too much. And. I would like to see that. I think it's a little bit more old school. You know, you see that from closer sometimes, but as a rubber mean, takes the foul tip. Of course, the most famous cutter being from Mariano Rivera. Mariano Rivera, yeah. But it's a harder pitch to get well in an arsenal, and also it can look a lot like a faster slider. And it can mm. be hard to tell because sliders today can get very fast. Just ask Edwin Diaz. Swing and a miss. Rubner goes down swinging on the full count. So no runs, no hits, no errors. One man was left on base, but he got down, down through the, due to the double play. The Tampa Spartans get one, two, and three. We go to the bottom of the third. Still no runs on the scoreboard. You are watching Tampa Spartans.tv. So we're back here in the bottom of the third. Nico Saladino will lead off for the Tampa Spartans, the number eight batter in the lineup. So Saladino is the last outing. Went two for two with two hits in the RBI. So a good outing for him. Looking to continue here for the Tampa Spartans. Pitches foul tipped. I'll say for Saladino, he's been a very fun player to see as the season has got further underway, hitting 261 right now. He's really settled in as a very good utility guy for the Spartans. He can fill in wherever you need him on the field, from second base to left field, center field, right field. That's a very versatile player and the type that I know Coach Urso likes. Pitch is inside, but call for a strike to count 0-2. Good location by Fisher. Only 30 pitches so far, but he's getting some really good locations and, and channeling in his... His inner abilities with his pitching. Here's the 0-2. Grounder. Right to Masha. He scoops it. Throws it to Tronson. And they get the out for the first out of the inning. So Cadenas is out. And the center fielder senior. With Cadenas up, watch out for the bunt. Yep. He knows how to beat the throws because he is one of the fastest players on the Spartan side back during the opening weekend. He went from first to home with a stolen base and thanks to a couple errant throws from Georgia College. I'm actually glad you mentioned that because we went out here and no man left on base. Oh, you are right. See, you see, you are right. Good, good guess. It's Taylor again, but I think he was hit. I'm not sure if he was hit. Is, was he hit? I think it he looked was. like he was, but... I think he got hit with, uh, on the fingers. But you were right about, about the bunt, though. It makes sense in this scenario. No men, no men on base. He's top of the lineup. 
I mean, excuse me, bottom of the lineup, but he is very fast, and it would make sense to try to get the tone going for the Spartans, but doesn't seem like he got hit, so he's going to step back in the batter's box in a couple of seconds, and he will go at it again. Hard to tell exactly where because we were looking behind Cadenas here, but I believe that took, a, thumb, to be took a weird bounce. It probably hit by his wrist, by his hands, and that can definitely sting, but he feels okay, and I know he's going to battle through it. Cadenas, the old one. Inside, but count 0-2. Great, great location by, by Fisher. You could tell he has a lot of arsenals up his sleeve. A good pitch set is always good for a pitcher. It's when you need to be a successful starter, and we can see Fisher rotating through those pitches well. The 0-2. Grounder again to Marsha, and they get the second out. I go to the top of the... Oh, excuse me. Yeah, what's disappointing there is I think if that grounder from Cadenas was the grounder from Saladino, he could have beat that out because you saw just how quick Cadenas was hustling to first. Unfortunately, that was sharper than the last time to Mosher, and he gets the throw by a full step. So now we have EJ Combo. Combo, in his last outing, his last at-bat, he singled. And we mentioned a Combo leading off for the first time as he takes the ball outside. I think this will definitely, in my opinion, I think this will definitely, you'll see a change in scenery with him leading off and maybe in, in the, down the road and, and you know, the seventh, the eighth, we might see a run or two with him leading off. Pop fly to shallow left. He's going, going, going. A warning track, Combo gets to second really quickly. I really thought that was going to be out. I thought it was going to be a routine pop fly, fly out, but that ball sailed to the warning track where the national champions are presented out there. A good hit by Combo as he gets the fist bump from Coach Urso. Taylor, what are your thoughts about that play? Fly balls can be deceiving. I think that's a big lesson right there. It got nicely in the gap right by the wall, just a few feet away from a home run, which would have given the Spartans a lead. But unfortunately for him, it'll drop, and he'll have to settle with a very clutch two-out double. EJ Combo, only 5'8", but has so much power in his swing. It's a testimony to what he works out with in the, in the gym and just his uh, workout regimen. But nevertheless, Drew Earhart is up as he foul tips it. Behind home plate. Earlier this year, Brandon, I was talking with Carson Case, who's still currently recovering from an injury. Hopefully next season he'll be able to have a big impact for the Spartans on the mound. But I asked him, who's the Spartan batter you'd least like to face in a high leverage spot? He said Drew Earhart. Mm. So keep that in mind whenever you see a runner in scoring position with Drew Earhart. <laughs> Fisher checks combo. Nobody was there at the time. You always have to be careful in making those moves. You can very easily be called for a balk, but thankfully he had the runner there that he was quickly able to throw it back to. Earhart, the old one. Ball low, count one and one. Pitch is recovered by Heilick. Could have, could have been a potential wild pitch, and Combo would have went to third, but good recovery by Heilick as the count goes to 2-1. and one. It's important for him to get on top of those pitches that get into the dirt because it bounces away. As you mentioned, Combo gets to third, and he's even closer in a more dangerous spot. He probably scores on any hit because he's going to be running with two away. 2-1 to Earhart. Swing and a miss. Count two and two, a great pitch outside from Fisher. He aimed the slider well, he got it down in the dirt, and he made Earhart look foolish, and that is not easy to do. And his head was turned out on that one, so how could he even see the ball when to his contact? It's always a testimony that always you have to keep your head in when, when you hit the ball. Choke up on the bat as he's doing right now. The two two. Low ball. So we have full count here, two outs. One man on base, that is Combo, in scoring position. 
Earhart, the full count, has an opportunity to get the the first run of the night here. We will see. Full count. Grounder. Foul. Earhart just looking to stay alive, but also if he gets some walked, that's not a huge deal. In fact, you could even argue it's just as good because you get J.D. Urso up in this high leverage spot with two away. And if you're Fisher, do you want to quickly try to get Earhart out, or do you want to maybe take your chances against Urso? That's not a good decision to have. It's a lose-lose situation more times than not. Grounder. Right to Mets. He fields it and gets it to Tronson to end the inning for the Panthers. They get out of a jam, a jam, Taylor. But nevertheless, they close the inning out in the bottom of the third. We go to the top of the fourth. Thank you guys for watching TampaSpawns.tv. And we are back at the University of Tampa. I'm Taylor Storthy alongside Brandon Davis. I think Brandon's got a quick little photo opportunity that he stepped away for. He'll be back in just a second. But Mets leads off for Davenport. The Spartans and Panthers have been back and forth, but not in terms of scoring runs, in terms of solid pitching and solid fielding. Polkel, 40 pitches, three strikeouts, two hits in his first three innings. Number 41 is taken for strike one. Metz was able to get on board with a single last time. He's the most dangerous hitter for the Panthers. He's going to ground this one up the middle. Urso ranging back. And he got him just in time with a throw. A great play by J.D. Urso. And I'm going to be honest, even though I'm supposed to be a little biased towards the Spartans, I would not have been surprised if the umpire gave the tie to the runner. But a great play by Urso to get Metz out with maybe half a step to spare at most. That was very similar to his first hit, but not hard enough to split the infield. The first pitch taken for strike one for Showers. He flew out back in the first inning. That ultimately left Mets stranded to end that top inning. Polkel continuing. Interesting choice here from Coach Urso to give him his first starting opportunity of the game. I mentioned it earlier, but Polkel had two out, one outing so far. He went two and a third, surrendering just one earned run. He was also able to pick up three strikeouts alongside three walks, doing a lot better today in that regard. And we're going to find ourselves with a one-two count here. This one a little wide in the dirt. And just like Highlight, Gutcher has been able to get in front of a few of the wild pitches. And we're seeing that, and that's a lot. I used to be a catcher myself, and I, even though it's abnormal to be a left in a catcher, it's very hard on the knees to try to get up and get a jump. This one ripped into the gap, and no need to get up with a jump here if you're able to hit it into the outfield. We'll slide into second safely with a one-out double, avoiding a potential double play opportunity for the time being. A well-timed base hit to bring up Robinson. Brandon Robinson was able to get his second hit of the year last time. Wow. Is that, is that serious? Are you serious? Wow. Yeah. Okay. Good for him. He was in a little bit of a hitting slump to start the campaign, and although we definitely don't want him to continue to hit well against us for the Spartans, it is good for him to try to break out of a slump, and getting that hit to open up the second inning 
is definitely useful and certainly should help in the long term. He also has a chance now with a runner in scoring position to potentially bring home the first run of the ball game. Here's the 1-0. Taken on the outside corner, strike one. And we know with number, the numbers don't lie in baseball. When it comes to hitting slumps, when it comes to hitting streaks, it's always bound to hit a, a, a peak or a fall. So for him, for Robinson to come back. And this one's going to be a line to Nunez. And he actually dropped it as he was trying to make the throw back to second uh, originally. But, however, he had already caught it. And the umpire said, oh, don't worry about the throw to first. We're going to call that a line out. Mm-hmm. Also, the good news is, is that even though Nunez uh, wasn't perfect in the transition, there wasn't a play to be made for the double play. Erhard and Urso were just about as surprised as Showers was on the base path there. They would not have had time to double it up, but two away quickly for Tronson. This one just outside, Gutcher on top of it. One know here, and again, a beautiful night for baseball, and we see a pretty good contingent for Davenport here, Brandon, out in the stands. A really good outing. I actually was going to my class, and it was, I believe it was 1.50 in the afternoon, and I'm seeing a lot of Davenport f jerseys, shirts everywhere taking up my parking spots. But they were here really early, <laughs> and they were here to support. So you could, it's very evident. You can see it in the attendance right now. This one fouled away, and indeed, bringing a large supporter, uh, support group of fans. And, well, they're down in Florida long term. After this, they're going to face off against Gannon uh, tomorrow at, in Davenport, Florida, at Northwest or Northeast Regional Park. They also then will travel to Embry Riddle at Silva Stadium on Wednesday. They're in the midst of a three game split series against three different teams. And in the weekend, they're going to continue the Russ Matt Invitational at Northeast Regional Park. They'll face Ashland and then have a double header against Minnesota State Mankato. So this is a fun chance for Davenport fans to take a long weekend or two down in Florida and enjoy the warm weather. And for you, for, for the people who don't know what Davenport, Florida is, it's approximately, I would say, 30 to 40 minutes from Orlando. So if you're Orlando native and you're supporting the Davenport uh, Panthers, we appreciate your, your, your support and your, you guys watching TampaSpons.tv. champions Davenport in Florida but the Panthers of course hailing all the way from the Great Lakes <laughs> over in the Grand Rapids Michigan so <laughs> but it can always be tough there's uh, we've had teams from uh, Maryville like from New York I believe that's where the Saints were from as this one is popped out into the infield to end the inning as the Panthers, unfortunately, won't be able to convert in a scoring position like this. Spartans have a chance entering the bottom of the fourth. Urso, Nunez, and Doskow will be due up. Champions know how to seize opportunities. When they see moments of greatness unfold right before their eyes, they push as hard as they possibly can. And then they push harder. Because the heart of a champion never settles never quits and never stops giving its all we are champions we are division two we go big we give it everything we've got and we win on the field on our campuses in our communities for our causes in our careers we rise to become champions in everything we do we are division two and there are no limits here we make our time count. We set our own path. We become champions on our terms. It's time to up your game because we're here to play and learn. But most importantly, we're here to discover ourselves, our vision, our heart, our drive to achieve every goal we aim for because we want to be champions at the highest level, life. At Division Two, the opportunities are here. Are you ready? Well, we are back. <laughs> Bottom of the fourth inning. 45 pitch, uh, pitches for Fisher so far. He's only had one strikeout, but he hasn't needed it. He's been able to force clutch ground outs and get outs in situations where he's needed it. This one taken low for ball one. J.D. Urso singled back in the first inning. Unfortunately, Urso's single 
was with the bases empty when Combo was picked off and a great throw by Heilick to second. Here's the 1-0. This one high and inside. 2-0 for Urso. But again, Urso, another strong start to the season. Certainly one of the best players in the Spartan side, and he's got a few more years left unless the MLB would come calling early. Not an impossibility, but it would probably be difficult for him to go, I think, this quickly into his college career. But again, he's got a very brilliant resume. And of course, his father, one of the all-time greats. We were discussing beforehand that they probably should just rename the stadium to Urso Stadium at this Honestly, stage. Honestly, I mean, they have a dorm room named after him. I don't believe it's entirely aligned to his family lineage. I'm not sure. But with Urso, his credentials, his contribution to this university, he came up a few years after Yankee great, Yankee great Tino Martinez, but he's definitely established his legacy as well as his son. You see out in left center field the national champions banner. It's yeah, I think it's readable on the broadcast. It can't be tough as well since it is pretty far out, and we don't have a lot of active cameras. As Bruce, uh, uh, sorry, as Jack would say, we only have the one stationary camera behind home plate. But Urso has had a legacy of success with the Spartans, and he is one of the greatest to ever do it. This one taken high in Urso, ball four in the full count. He'll walk 1,000 miles, or in this case, 90 feet to first, and that'll bring up Anthony Nunez with no one out, one on. As the bottom of the fourth continues here, Nunez taking the plate, the switch hitter, and the left side of the batter's box because he is up against a righty. This one taken inside, ball one. And Nunez struck out looking. Never anything you want to leave on your fine print. And striking out looking is not a really good thing you want to go to the back to the dugout with, but you keep that thought, you relish it, and you come back to the batter's box, and you come back with vengeance as he has an opportunity here. Pickoff attempts. Urso is safe, and indeed, you always want a little bit of revenge once you're caught down looking. That was the only strikeout Fisher had as well. So we'll have to see if Nunez can find some revenge here, especially as the Spartans are still looking for their first run. That's the second time in a row he's thrown a pickoff to first. Urso had stolen a base earlier. That's definitely the reason why he's a little bit wary. Coach Urso is not afraid to get active in the base paths. See if this one will be the 1-0. It will, and will be inside 2-0. With runners on, neither team has actually converted a hit. So even though team, both teams have had seven hits in the game, they haven't been able to get one when a runner has been aboard. For Davenport, they're 0-7 with runners on base. For Spartans, it's just 0-4. Hitters count early, though, for Nunez. This one taken. And strike one. A nice little off speed. I believe a backdoor slider. And as a batter, what was the pitch you struggled against with the most? <laughs> Me? Yeah. Uh, I would say definitely a curveball. Definitely a curveball. I was a little bit anxious as a, as a kid. Still am anxious. I'm taking ashwagandha right now to just to ease my anxiety a little bit. But, you know, I still have some tendencies of that but yeah as a batter I would say the curveball definitely it's something you have to practice and practice with and just be patient in the batting cage and I think all the 12 year olds or 13 year olds out there they could definitely attest to this what I'm trying to say but they're going to get used to the pitch and they will probably get better at looking at it and reacting to it better but yeah I would say the curveball for me pickoff attempt again on her so he is safe I'm not sure if we've seen Fisher go with a curveball or if he's gotten it in his pitch arsenal, but a well-placed curveball can be incredibly hard to deal with, whether you're pitching it like Kershaw, getting it in the upper half of the zone, making batters look foolish, or getting someone swinging in the dirt. We've seen the spike curveball be a very popular way of throwing it, where you throw it intentionally further down to try to get an early swing and miss. By that time, I think Nunez might have been looking a little lower. He gets beaten with some heat upstairs. One away, one on. That's going to bring up EJ Dosko. Dosko, one and one on the night so far. One and one offensively, but having a tremendous defensive outing tonight. Very, very in tune with the infield. The chemistry is right there. 
and it's definitely prevalent, and it's going to transcend into his offensive outing here with him in the, in the batter's box. This one's pickoff throw to Ursa. Would mind uh, letting me know about Dosko's height really quickly at first base? His height? Yep. Yeah, so Dosko stands at approximately six foot on the dot. He's mine. He's my height, but he's 255 out of Miami, Florida. Six foot, 255. He definitely has a lot of muscle density on him. It's a reason he's got so much power behind his bat. But as well, being 6'4", that's a very good advantage at first base. Normally, height isn't a huge factor when you're out on the field. And in fact, it could be a little harder as a catcher like yourself when you were playing because, you know, you have to get on, you're on your knees. You're bending down. That can put a lot of stre uh, strain down there. But well, at I first play, base... I only played catcher for two years. Oh, okay. <laughs> so then, yeah, not as bad. But if you were still playing catcher, say, collegiately or with club, that is something you always have to be careful about. But first base, it's great if you're tall because you can make those catches. You can go down into the splits easier, making plays like that. Height is very useful, and it's unique as a position where you see a lot more advantages being taller. Now, runner on, one away. This one foul back from Dosco. The count's going to go to one and one. Yeah, I think for the fans who are listening, especially the parents, if you guys played back in the day, I think that's an excellent analysis you just insinuated, you know, what you just said. I feel like that it's very important to point out, especially even with relief pitches, if they're tall, having a difference with the velocity and pitches, it's all about the height, the, the muscle density, bone density, BMI, all this psychological and, um, and scientific stuff do come into the play of sports, and we tend to neglect it in a way, but it's very, very very important when it comes to baseball because numbers in terms of science does not lie sometimes they can tell white lies i mean we mentioned ej combo he's not necessarily the frame of a power hitter but we know he can hit nukes like the rest of them yeah he's had walk off home runs already this season and has been a huge bat in the spartans lineup even though he is just 5 8 but indeed more often than not you'll see taller players having a little more power whether it's on the mound or in the batter's box we hadn't even mentioned pitchers before but that's also another great point one and two here for Dosco. He's got a runner on. A runner who's had, I think, five or six pickoff of throws so far this inning. Well, make it seven this time. As Fisher once again is making sure that Urso isn't getting his second stolen base. He doesn't want him to go for a 30 for 30 season. <laughs> that might be a little tough to get 30 home runs, I think. Uh, leader for the Spartans may have been Urso with maybe like 11 last season. But certainly he doesn't want to have Urso lighting up the stolen base record books here. 1-2 again. Swung on and missed. Got him with an outside heater. And you can tell Dosco just knew it, but just couldn't do anything about it. Yeah, that was a bad out, a bad, a bad at bat for Dosco. The first strike, the, the second strike that he had, he had, he had a late swing to it. So he wasn't really confident in that at bat itself. Tough for Dosco, who'll fall to one for two on the day. But already it's still, I think, giving a slight boost to his stats because he's barely hitting under 500 this season he'll have another chance later on of course hunt will also have a chance here with two away to try to get the first spartan hit with a runner aboard another pickoff th attempt and urso once again just staying back he hasn't made a stolen base attempt yet i don't want to think i want to say it's paranoia but you know with no runs right now i think that he just kind of wants to ensure that urso does not advance he's pitching up to 60 uh, 60 pitches so far he's having a good outing he doesn't want anything to mess it up I will mention, you just mentioned 60 pitches under four innings. That's good for the Spartans. They're getting to the pitcher. They're getting a lot of pitches yes. out of him. Even a, about a four-pitch at bat from Dosco, that's not great, but you are still helping that pitch count go up easier. The worst-case scenario is if you ground it on your first pitch to short, second, first double play, and you're immediately out of the inning. And speaking of foul balls, you're definitely seeing that, especially in the bottom of the third, the average pitch, pitch at bat count was eight. I would say, because you saw a lot of people hitting the foul balls, especially to the opposite end, the fighting. And that's what, that's what you want to see from Coach Ursula. You want to see a, a fight at the, at, bat, at the batter's box. You want to see them fighting for the pitches and waiting for the right pitch so that way they could get a hit and just continue on. So 0-2 here for Hunt. After that foul ball, continues to find himself trailing. Tampa would like to try to get Urso moving. And he held up. And the count will go to a one and two now for Hunt. Tried to bait him with an outside heater that had retired Dosco. Didn't work this time. 
And of course, as a right-handed pitcher, it's a little tougher to face a left-handed batter because left-handed batters usually in a slightly better spot. And that's where the cutter really comes into handy. This one gets away, so the pickoff throw finally didn't work out for Davenport's favor. is going to be rounded to third, and he will be holding up at third, gaining two bases on the throwing error from Fisher. Yeah, Urso definitely, definitely taunted him in that in this at bat. You could definitely see, I would say, how many throws did he, did he throw to Tronson? About five of them. But this is where it goes, the paranoia. You don't have to do it, and look what happened. He, now he's advanced to third into scoring position. You just went from a good, a good position now into maybe a potentially detrimental one as Nunez, I mean, excuse me, Hunt has a potentially RBI single up at bat. All Hunt would need to do is get a hit, and certainly yeah, yeah. he would bring Urso home. But he is still down. 1-2 in the count. This one's taken very low. It's 2-2. Two and two. But indeed, that's one of the risks of being a little too, I'll, give, I'll use your word for it, paranoid on a base runner. And in fact, that is a very costly error at this stage of the game. No runs yet on the board. Very much is open for the taking. The first run could be crucial in a really strong pitcher's duel like this. And Hunt will continue to stay alive. Fisher's pitch count start to border 70 if he's able to foul just a few more off. Yeah, his, might, his night might be ending in the next half inning. Maybe the next inning. We'll see. Bullpen's currently empty for Davenport, but that'll be a good thing to keep an eye on. And of course, you can't see it from the broadcast angle, but the Davenport bullpen is visible on the field. Spartans, nope, safely tucked away in the back. Two and two. Hunt fouls this one away one more time. Gutcher would have a chance if Hunt is able to get on base and keep the inning alive. The bottom four hitters for the Spartans currently combined 0 for 4. They'll be looking to turn those tides around, whether it's here or next inning. So two's all on the board, with two away and a 2-2 count. Hunt's going to ground this one over to second, who's playing up in the outfield. That positioning is good enough to get the out. So Tampa is able to get a runner 90 feet away. But unfortunately, it's yet another runner stranded as we enter the top of the fifth inning, still tied at zero. I pledge. I pledge. I pledge. I pledge. I am an NCAA student athlete. And I pledge to be a champion of unity on my team, on my campus, and in my community. I pledge to embrace differences and strive for inclusion and collaboration. I pledge to stand against racism, hate, and discrimination. I pledge to strive for love, care, and forgiveness. I pledge to stand against silence, deceit, and obscurity. I pledge to strive for dialogue, truth, and understanding. I pledge to stand against fear and doubt. I pledge to strive for trust and belief in one another. I pledge to stand against complacency and stagnancy. I pledge to strive for change and growth. I commit to supporting my fellow student athletes in all circumstances that impact them. I commit to both choosing unity personally and encouraging it for all. I pledge these things because we are stronger together. United, United as, as one. one. And we are back at the University of Tampa Stadium. I'm Taylor Storley alongside Brandon Davis. We're about to get ready with the top of the fifth inning. New pitcher for the Spartans, Alex Caney, enters the game. He was part of a very successful Spartan bullpen last year and has been in and out of the rotation. He'll be acting as a bit of a follower here. Currently leads the team with the highest ERA. That was because he had one or two starts that he did get hit around a little bit. And, of course, I should really stress that with only nine and a third innings pitched, you can't really tell how good a pitcher is going to be doing from an ERA stat alone. In fact, Brayden Nelson has a 5.23 ERA, and he's been lights out. Like, when he has been pitching, he has been absolutely dominant. But the only downside is he's surrendered three home runs. And one of those home runs was a grand slam. In fact, six of the seven earned... Or actually, sorry, all six of the Brayden Nelson earned runs have come off of home runs. Other than that, Nelson hasn't done anything wrong, so that's where you see those stats at the start of the season and think, oh, maybe he hasn't been doing so good. No, it's Braden Nelson being as good as ever, and no, it's Alex Caney still being a really good pitcher. That's why Urso has got a lot of trust bringing him in here in a close game in the top of the fifth. Dosko with a great sliding grab, one away on the first pitch. 
And yeah, and that's, again, Dasko having continuance in his defensive performance. You can see it's very, very prevalent on the night. Shvardarov is going to be up here with one away. So far, 179 average, below the Mendoza line to start the year. However, a sex, uh, only, uh, almost a successful day. Actually, I do apologize. The live snap broadcast hadn't updated to Mosher in time, so it caught me off guard. It's Mosher currently at the plate. He flew out last time. He's up with one away. The second opponent, Kaney, will face from the bullpen. Taken outside, one and one. Beautiful night, some of the best scenery in college baseball. You can see some of the lights out in the Tampa skyline by the Sykes building. You see the massive Bank of America building. You see the Strass Center. 78% 70, humidity. I don't really feel it, to be honest, Taylor. It feels really good tonight. If you were, if you guys are, I know you guys are not listening, but if you guys ever go to the Riverwalk during this time of the day, please do. It's very relaxing. It really is. It's nice to be out at night because it never gets too cold here in Florida unless it's really in the winter. And I'm from the Northeast as well. So. We're both from the Northeast. Yeah, we yeah. both have the Northeast sort of thick skin when it comes to the cold. We can deal with it. But even sometimes when it's chilly at night, it's sometimes nice. Maybe put on a long sleeve shirt and go out, get some nice fresh air. And there we go, getting with a big strikeout on Mosher. Getting him looking is Caney and two quick outs to start the top of the fifth. But... Just to continue. Yeah, beautiful night here in Tampa. Heilick up now. Great game behind the plate. At the bat, not yet. He struck out back in the third inning. Here's the first pitch from Caney. This one fouled away. And even though the netting is there to protect the fans, it's hard to sometimes not flinch when you see a hard foul ball going towards you. Have you ever seen that video on Instagram when the foul ball comes to the screen and you kind of have that knee-jerk reaction on your, when you're watching it? All the time. All in the fact, time. when I was over in Elmira this summer, that happened to me literally. A foul ball came into the booth through the open window. Wow. I had to duck out of the way. And I've told this story, I think, once or twice to Jack. Thankfully, I was fine. I was able to dodge it in plenty of time. And in the end, I got a free souvenir out of it. Yeah, souvenirs. Got to love souvenirs. I remember I got... One souvenir, I think it was against, it was the Mets versus the Cubs in 2009, July 2009. They made a pitch and chase the Cubs, and he kind of tossed me the ball as he went back to the bullpen. I mean, excuse me, the dugout. Those are always the fun memories that yeah. you can have forever from baseball games. And sadly, unfortunately, for fans here, a little harder to catch the foul balls or home runs with the massive fence around the stadium. Might not be fully visible in broadcast, but because we see a lot of student traffic and, well, actual traffic, over on Cass Street from time to time. There is a massive fence around the stadium. This one's going to drop. And just a well-hit fly ball to split everyone. From Saladino to Gadanis to Urso, it drops for a two-out single for Hyluk. I really don't think Urso had a chance to get that ball, but you really got to commend him for this effort. He's very fast. And, you know, I don't know if... I don't know if Saladin could have got there, Saladino, but... Nevertheless, the ball did drop, so, yeah. Well, it's tough because it was a hard-hit ball, but also didn't go too high. So it's a really tough blooper to get to. Yeah. But it's also a borderline because it had more power than what you normally expect from a bloop single like True. that. 0-1 taken in the outside corner for Valone. Valone grounded out into a double play last time. It was 4-6-3 from Erhard Urso Dosko. Runner goes. Throw from Gutcher. Offline, great play there by Earhart tracking back, making sure it didn't go all the way back, which would have allowed Heilig to get to third. Yeah, great play by Earhart. It's a routine practice they do in practice, and every team does this, but it was definitely, definitely important for him to be there because he could have advanced to third and potentially score in the next few runs, in the next few plays. So good job by Earhart. Swung on and missed, one and two, so Caney even though now he has to worry about a runner in scoring position. He's one strike away from ending the inning. But indeed, I think Cadenas would have been able to stop him from going home, but that is a risk whenever a wild throw goes like that into the outfield. 1-2 from Caney, and he's going to get him with another strikeout. That is important there to shut him down. 
One hit, one runner stranded, and that'll end the top of the fifth. Do up for the Spartans is Gutcher, Saladino, and Cadenas. 789, you'll be back with more on Spartans.tv. Tampa Spartans. Won't you take me to Spartans Baseball? All right, we're back with the bottom of the fifth inning. Ignore my terrible singing. Uh, I'll sing it around with the stadium PA blaring some music for the fans. Always a fun song. Fun to sometimes sing along. Spartans Bats will want to get singing here. Gutcher, Saladino, Cadenas. They're going to be the three do up for the Spartans this go around. Gutcher last time grounded out into a double play. A weird one, a 3-6. Uh, from earlier. You don't normally see those uh, double plays, Brandon. The 3-6 that uh, had befallen Gutcher before. Yeah, that was an impressive 3-6 double play, and it, it, it was a little bit slower than the professionals, obviously, but we don't really see that usually, so it was definitely, definitely very eventful to see. First pitch to Gutcher, taken low for ball one. Wonder if we'll eventually see someone warming up in the bullpen for Davenport. That'll be a question. We'll have to wait and see for the answer. But for now, Fisher continues. Strike one taken, just a little low and just in the zone. Fisher looking. He's got his sign. As we're set with the 1-1. This one in the dirt, 2-1. and one. I think I mentioned a little bit earlier, but Gutcher, a solid start to the season. Entering the game with that 7-26 and hitting record. He's also had five walks to six strikeouts. This one fouled back, 2-2. Two and two. So Schlichty, Parker Schlichty, uh, the, the ever Tampa Spartans catcher again, the break on the night. But I had the, the, I had the privilege to commentate the Tampa Spartans softball team who they were versing Palm Beach Atlantic. And the, he was, I was actually commentating Parker's sister, so it was another slick these because they're from around that area in West Palm Beach. Swing and a miss for Gutcher is going to go down strikes, but funny to see a small world. Sometimes siblings might be for different teams. A little sibling rivalry over the weekend. Yep. <laughs> Unfortunately for uh, Parker's sister, Parker's teams took home all the victories. Now my question is, who saw whose game? Because the, the Tampa Spartans softball team, they versed the Palm Beach Atlantic Selfish at home. Whereas the men's traveled all the way to Palm Beach Atlantic to verse the baseball team in West Palm Beach. So, Indeed. Yeah. Saladino, the lefty, up now. He's grounded out last time in the third inning. And will this be another ground out? We'll have to wait for this throw, and unfortunately it will. Mosher made a good backhand grab and timely throw to first to get the second out of the inning. As that will bring up Jose Cadenas. He's 0 for 1 today and looking to get back on base. I have a feeling he'll try for a bunt again, but it didn't go well last time. Hey, a bunt is all you need to set the tone. It goes it, it goes under underrated, but I would say... He'll just I be say hoping... That, I would say the new generation now, they should definitely be passing on their bunts, always. It's very, very important. They also have the larger bags now that make it a little bit easier to get to there on the base paths. Oh, get yeah. an extra yeah. little space for the steps. Referencing the new baseball rules, the MLB rules, enlarging... I believe we talked about this with Jack, enlarging the, the bases. I'm not sure on the mathematics, but I feel like it's just a, I think it's about six inches longer, I would say. I believe so, yeah. 
They're a noticeable size, and that hopefully will encourage teams to be more aggressive in the base paths, giving us some more stolen bases, even potentially more of the bunt as this pitch is taken above, and Cadenas up 2-0 here. Tampa's bats have been somewhat quiet, but with two outs, they are 400, two for five. Swung on and missed, and it's 2-1 count. The 2-1 here to Cadenas. This one's going to be sent over to second. And that will end the inning. So the Spartans go down in order. Another clean inning from Fisher, even though that pitch count will keep rising. The Spartans haven't been able to rise to the lead yet. They'll have to wait until the bottom of the sixth. And the top of the sixth is coming up with Rubner, Mets, and Showers. We'll be back with more Spartans baseball on TampaSpartans.tv. Let's see. So we're back at the top of the sixth inning. I'm going to be honest. It's sometimes a little tough to wake up on Monday morning. It's almost around uh, this type of the day where you start to get hit with uh, a little bit of a tired bug. You get a couple of yawns in here as you're sort of settling back into the school week. I feel great, back Sam. I took a cold shower. I feel great. <laughs> wow. I took my shower back in the morning. That did help me wake up before my first class. But oh, I'll say it definitely can be a little bit draining. My sleep schedule is also not perfect, sadly. Oh, Taylor, what, you you want to know what happened this morning, real quick? I woke up at three forty-two on the dot in the morning. Somebody was banging on my apartment door. Then I woke up again at four thirty-three in the morning. Somebody was banging on my door again. So I I was coming off with four hours of sleep, but nevertheless, I still hit the gym. I still had a cold shower. Still prayed. So I feel really great right now. God bless. All right. So I hope you get some better sleep. God willing. More power to you. All right. Uh, dude, it can be tough because sometimes I feel good. Sometimes, you know, you feel a little tired. You feel a little sluggish, but it's always sometimes during this part of the game, too. You get through the middle of it I have a little bit of a lack of energy, and that's something you have to avoid if you're on the field or if you're Caney on the mound. But thankfully, Caney's looking good. Hunter's also looking good so far. He's 0 for 2 and looking to convert this time at the plate. Caney already just one pitch ahead, although one more ball would get that count full. Here's the 2-2 to Rudner. Taken outside, and so we will get a full count. But we'll say the morning's the best time to get a quick run or workout in. Of course. Think about it. If you wake up at 4 a.m. or 6 a.m., you're beating probably 80% of the people. They, especially down here, they, they wake up at 9, 10, 11. A lot of people from the north I talk to, they, they're like, oh, I have to struggle to, fall, um, to, to wake up. And I'm like, look, you've got to be disciplined. And that's a testimony to the Tampa Spartans. They're very disciplined right now with not conceding any runs. But you got, it's all about discipline. That's the foundation. Caney records another strikeout to start the inning. That's his third of the game. And now he's going to be facing off against Mets. Strike one taken. Mets had a sharp grounder last time that was fielded beautifully by J.D. Urso. But we'll see if Mets can try to convert for a second hit of the day. This one inside ball one.
Each team's hitting stats for the day. Four for 20 is how Davenport has been. Tampa, four for 17. This one's grounded and will remain foul. Davenport actually hasn't gotten a runner on with a walk yet, and I believe they haven't been hit by any pitches either, so they've only been able to get runners on when they've actually had hits. Oh, they actually did get one runner as well off a wild pitch strike three. Yeah, yeah. So even though that did count as a Spartan strikeout, it still also counted for a base runner. Base, yep, exactly. But apart from that, Spartans, great control, great job limiting unnecessary base runners. And again, if you prevent people from getting on base, you can win the game. This slider, very close, but the referee's just going to... Refer... Man, why did I say referee? 2-2, <laughs> two -two, this slider just missing the zone. Personally, I feel that call might have been also missed very much. I thought that was a strike, but that's why I'm in the booth and not behind on plate. And that's one of the worst times you could ever see a commentator's curse. That fastball drifting too yeah. far inside and plunking Mets. He'll walk over to first. One are on. One away. One away. So when the Tampa Spartans, when they, when they actually went to travel to West Palm Beach over the weekend, I tried to do a school assignment. I was doing a cover segment based on Title IX, but I was actually trying to get access to the baseball field. They did not allow me access due to an Adidas commercial that was being filmed. Ooh. Wanda Franco, the baseball shortstop for the Tampa Bay Rays, was there. And they were telling me, look, he's here. He was here on the field. I really didn't care, to be honest. I was just trying to get my assignment done, but... You could see the marketing and just the type of attention and attraction that this particular field, not necessarily just this particular field, but this campus is attracting around the city of Tampa. Indeed. I mean, as well, if you're potentially a Davenport viewer and hadn't really known about it, we just upgraded to a turf field over the winter, changing it from dirt and grass that we had always used. And the turf has given us some good baseball so far, and it looks beautiful. I think that's been one thing for sure. A few of the Eckerd players during uh, one of the weekend games has visited to check up on their former player, Gutcher, as Caney gets out of the inning. But they had mentioned how beautiful the stadium and new turf field was. We'll be excited to see the Tritons come back to campus later this spring. But for now, we still have this matchup against the Panthers as we enter the bottom of the sixth inning. A quick double play just got out of the jam. We'll be right back with more Spartans baseball after this. Champions know how to seize opportunities. When they see moments of greatness unfold right before their eyes, they push as hard as they possibly can. And then they push harder. Because the heart of a champion never settles, never quits, and never stops giving its all. We are champions. We are Division II. We go big, we give it everything we've got, and we win. On the field, on our campuses, in our communities, for our causes, in our careers. We rise to become champions in everything we do. We are Division II and there are no limits here. We make our time count. We set our own path. We become champions on our terms. It's time to up your game because we're here to play and learn. But most importantly, we're here to discover ourselves, our vision, our heart, our drive to achieve every goal we aim for because we want to be champions at the highest level life at division two the opportunities are here are you ready top of the order we're going to be back here at the bottom of the sixth i'm taylor storthy alongside brandon davis ej combo leading off and well brandon single double a triple and home run away from the cycle yeah, hopefully he can get that home run. Yeah. yeah, I know we'd certainly love that home run if he could get another one this season. I believe he had that walk-off. He did. It yeah, was back, I believe it was against, yeah, it was against Georgia College during a weekend with two extra inning games. EJ Combo hit a walk-off off a lefty, a moonshot to deep right field. Always a fun time to celebrate a walk-off home run. This wouldn't be a walk-off, and this isn't going to be a swing. It's going to be a bunt that is pulled away for 2-0. and oh. But we know Combo has the power in the bat. He also has great speed, great fielding. I dare would say he's a five-tool player. Yeah. An all-around athlete, and that's what you want in a player. Good scouting by the Tampa Spartans. Two and one taken inside. <clears throat> and again, Combo, see how he can continue here. 
319 average, of course, entering today. 447 slugging and 400 on base percentage. I think those are about average for the majority of Spartan stats as a team, as they currently average 336, 485 slugging, 425 on base percentage. Well, when, you, when you're when you a fan, you're hearing these stats, and you're going to be like, wow, this is spectacular. But it's really not a surprise, not to be biased, but it's really not a surprise when the Tempest Spawns are one of the most prestigious top two Division two tier, tier teams in this institution. But, yeah. Again, we are fourth ranked in the nation. Combo beats the throw that also had dragged Tronson off the bag. It was a good effort from Mosher, but wasn't in time and was also off target. That's a leadoff single, unless that is going to be great as an error. Nope, great as a single, and I think deservedly so. Earhart steps up. He's 0 for 2 today, but certainly due for a hit here. Yeah, as we just mentioned, of course, one of the best teams in college baseball. Number four ranked in the nation for D2. So not a surprise when the Spartans are performing. It's also what makes it tougher for Davenport. I know Palm Beach last weekend, they said that, yeah, our bats had really struggled during the Sunday game against the Spartans, but that's what happens when you face one of the best teams in the nation. And it's tough because we aren't the underdogs. We're always the Goliath, and we have to struggle with beating Davids, avoid complacency. But for now, Spartans getting some hits. Taylor, Fisher finding his first struggles of the game. This could be the turning point, Taylor, that we were talking about. You know, this is the one-two combo. A combo, this is the things I was talking about. I said I predicted the seventh or eighth, but nevertheless, it came in the bottom of the sixth with Earhart making the contribution. But combo, nevertheless, starting and setting the tone. Now he gets the third. Big single there from Earhart. Action in the bullpen for Davenport. But we're not even going to see a mound visit here. They're going to let Fisher keep going as J.D. Urso, who's one for one with a walk, has a chance with a go-ahead run, 90 feet from home, fouled away. But I will say, this is a great spot for Urso, because even if he hits into a double play, Combo scores in Spartans lead. Thinking ahead, aren't you? <laughs> Certainly am. Hopefully it's not a jinx into a double play here. But we've seen the Spartans score a few RBIs off double plays this season. Pickoff throw, and I will say, definitely expect Earhart to move. In the major leagues, you'll normally see catchers make those throws to seconds somewhat seamlessly. That's why they're some of the best players in the world. But at a college level, even though we have great players like Heilick here, they're not going to be completely error-prone. And over the summer when I was uh, doing some commentary for Woodbat League, it was always important when players were going to be stealing second to be careful because that runner would go home. And you predicted Now, in this turn, yep. it just was a double play that I predicted gives the Spartans a one-run lead. Not the outcome so wanted, but he'll be satisfied to get an RBI and the Spartan lead on the board. We see Dalton Ross, I think, outside celebrating the Spartan lead here. If you ever see someone shooting across the bottom of the screen, getting a, a foul ball or a wild pitch after a play, that certainly our very own Dalton Ross comes in from the bullpen, does well, and also is the captain at retrieving balls for umpires and teams. Always exciting to see him rushing out there. Two away now for Nunez. Base is empty. Ooh. That one, uh, the legendary Bob Yucker would call just a bit outside. <laughs> yeah, but Dalton Ross, I've had the opportunity. I actually went to the pizza joint up the block, and it was uh, at Santoro's, and I had the liberty to talk to him and just you know, pick his thoughts about like creativity and media and everything like that because he does have some ideas with the correlation of our, our relationship with the merger. But, yeah, he's a very, very funny guy, I would definitely say. This one's going to be grounded sharply to Mosher, and that'll end the inning. Spartans do score, albeit on a double play, and the Spartans can't generate anything more than that, but sometimes one run is all you need. We'll enter the top of the seventh with more after this. I pledge. I pledge. I pledge. I, pledge. I am an NCAA student athlete. And I pledge to be a champion of unity on my team, on my campus, and in my community. I pledge to embrace differences and strive for inclusion and collaboration. I pledge to stand against racism, hate, and discrimination. I pledge to strive for love, care, and forgiveness. I pledge to stand against silence, deceit, and obscurity. I pledge to strive for dialogue, truth, and understanding. I pledge to stand against fear and doubt. I pledge to strive for trust and belief in one another. I pledge to stand against complacency and stagnancy. I pledge to strive for change and growth. I commit to supporting my fellow student athletes in all circumstances that impact them. 
I commit to both choosing unity personally and encouraging it for all. I pledge these things because we are stronger together. United, United as, as one. one. And we're back. Taylor Sorthy alongside Brandon Davis. By the way, let's give you a quick update over at the Namoli Family Complex. Tampa Women's Lacrosse winning 18-4 against Georgian Court. In just about 14 minutes, they'll be able to wrap up another victory. Another great start for the season for the women's lacrosse team. And again, Tampa, so many great sports from volleyball. Once again, making the Super Regionals an unfortunate sweep loss in the finals. Men's lacrosse still undefeated with J.B. Clark. And of course, baseball now finally having taken the lead in the bottom half of the sixth. Well, not to mention that Tampa Swans tennis team, women's tennis team, won the third straight match. They were actually away at West Palm Beach, and they had the liberty to watch the Tampa Swans play. They traveled separately, yes, of course, but they did watch their Friday night outing where the Tampa Swans won away. So, yeah, the, the women's team, they had a very, very good outing. They won their matches, all the matches. They won 5-2, to be exact, and now they're... Back here, they're going to be versing St. Petersburg on Wednesday at 3 o'clock here at home in Tampa, Florida. So, yeah, it's really the women's basketball team, men's basketball team. We're doing it all here at the Tampa Spons. Sports. So a lot of great, there. indeed, a lot of great sports here. And baseball with another strong start to this inning here. As while we were still discussing, Robinson had a early pop out. And count is now 2-0. and is, No, 2-1-1. and or one and one is That one was almost just a second late from Roberto Knox Reyes. I personally thought that was a little bit inside, but Knox Reyes just felt it was close enough to warrant the strike call for Tronson. But this one is too far inside. It's 2-1. and one. But Caney doing a good job from the bullpen. You see a ball being tossed, but we don't think anyone's going to be actively warming up just yet. This one's foul back, and it's 2-2. Two -two. Caney could get strikeout number four so far. Tronson 0 for 2. He would like to avoid going 0 for 3. This one foul back. Caney, the 1 0. This one will be fouled away. It's tough for him to keep the 1-0 lead. Yes, indeed. But he's done a good job so far. Once again, we'll see another 2-2. This one foul back. And that time we will see a souvenir for the crowd. One of the photographers gets it, and they'll actually send it back over for the Davenport dugout to be reused later into the game. The 2-2, two -two. this one ripped to left. It will drop in front of Saladino for a one-out single. Good rip on that one. Kind of lunged on it, but he got the better end of the, the bat, and he got it down for a nice hit. Yeah. And that's something that we haven't seen in the past few innings. And early in the first to first three innings, we were seeing a lot of good back contact by the Panthers, but it kind of slowed down here. But now it's seeming to come back. This is the time they need to bring it back as well as the time is running out for them to try to now close the one-run deficit that's formed. Dosko gets the lead runner. They won't have time to turn two as this one bounces out of Dosko's glove. But I'll say a heads-up play by Dosko to get the lead runner in a tough spot like that on the sharp grounder to first. Tell it. J.D. Urso had all the time in the world to get that another 3-6 double play, but he kind of hesitated on that one, as you can see. He held the ball for about one second, and... Uh, even though Dasko did b fumble the play, he did have a chance to get the 3-6 double play. So I'm wondering what was going through his head on that one. Probably because Dasko was actually still off the bag when he made that original throw. He needed some time for him to get back and set. The worst thing you can do is have a throw that gets away because the other player just isn't there. So I think he needed just to wait a second to get him set. It was also going to be a tough throw. So I think it was a contemplation of, do I just hold it and let the runner get there? Or do I try to beat him out? Pickoff attempt, runner back safely. Another one. So very much alert here for Shadarov. Shadarov with a close eye there from Kaney. 
Cox, he takes the lead but won't go. It's This one's outside, 1-0. Well, Tampa was able to finally get a hit with runners on base in the previous inning. Davenport haven't had such luck yet as we see yet another pickoff throw. I'll borrow your word one more time. Paranoia potentially <laughs> with a runner on. But as long as you're making the throw safely and not getting away, it's no harm no foul. when you do it. Mosher is going to take this one. It's strike one. Ooh, close one on that one. So once again, just testing, making sure Shadarov is not trying anything. Swung on in the dirt, strike two. And two outs here. They would just need a strikeout to get out of the inning. Or could find that via force out at second. A lot of good outcomes here for the Spartans. Caney looking for that best one. The one two. Here's a pickoff throw again. And Sharov back safe. Due up for the Spartans next thing will be Dosko, Hunt, and Gutcher. So solid bats that could try to help expand the Spartan lead. This one nearly to the Spartans dugout. The good news for the Spartans is, while Davenport will have more games tomorrow and the day after, Spartans are free until Friday as yeah. they embark on the road for a weekend series. So they don't have to worry about keeping Braden Nelson healthy from the bullpen. They could very much bring him in next inning and try to get him with a six-out save. This gives them a good time to have some rest and get ready for the weekend. Just inside, 3-2. and two. <clears throat> Always, I think, is going to have to be wary of taking with two strikes. He struck out looking last time. 3-2. Runner will certainly be going because there's no reason not to. It's a full count. Two away. Fouled away. And once again, kept in with the net. Masha definitely trying to get his run for the money here. He's definitely fighting Polko. I mean, excuse me, Kaney. In these crucial times, it's what you have to do as a batter. Runner goes. This one's grounded to short. Urso wouldn't have time to tag the bag, so we'll just make it a quick 6-3 out to end the inning. So the Spartans once again concede a base runner, but work their way out. And Kaney, another successful inning on the mound. That's now three innings for him with three strikeouts, two hits. And with the seventh inning stretch underway, we'll be back with more Spartans baseball on TampaSpartans.tv. And we are back here on the bottom of the seventh. The Tampa Spartans now lead one to nothing. We have a new pitcher here for those pa for the Panthers. The Panthers now have number 19, Spencer Vanovich, the senior left-handed pitcher.
will go against the first baseman, EJ Daskow. Daskow having a pretty good night on the, on the night. His first at-bat, he had a single, but nevertheless, his second at-bat had a, a strikeout. So we will see his first at-bat here. Daskow takes the strike for a count 0-1. We'll see if this changes the scenery of the game as we have a left-handed relief pitcher. We know in baseball, sometimes this does change the course of the game as pitching is very dictated in this game. Uh, we take a ball now low, count 1-1. This is a great time of the year for any baseball fan as we're finally getting back underway with spring training with the MLB. And, of course, we're in Florida, one of the best places to be with a lot of teams being down here in the Sunshine State for spring Ooh. training. As this one... Ooh. high and inside for count one two. Almost clipped his elbow, Taylor. That's a little bit of sweet chin music, if you will. <laughs> Daskow, the 2-1... Low. Count now three and one. Good discipline from Dosko early in the at bat, especially with potentially strong hitters, including pinch hitting, I believe, Jamarcus Lyons on deck. Jamarcus Lyons, okay. Potential pitch, pitch hitting. Foul tipped for now, full count. Grounder, foul. So it seems like Lions will be coming in for for Adam Hunt. Get some speed on there. As we know that Jamarcus Lions does have a lot of speed, so it does make sense to make this this call as Jamarcus Lions will probably get on base if he does. If he does, but I think even more as than the base runner, he is very very good at running the bases. So now we have Dasco gets the walk. Marcus Jamarcus Lions will be up to the bat. I think more than the speed aspect for Lions, it's got to be the it's platoon. The hitting too. It's because uh, Vanovich, yep. he's a left-handed pitcher. Yep. You don't want to run the lefty hunt against him because that's going to put him at a big disadvantage. You'd rather have someone like Lions at the plate to try to capitalize him facing a lefty. And Lions has had a great start to the year. Doesn't perfectly show it in the stat sheet. But I will say, he's been arguably the most unlucky man in Tampa all season long with so many hits that go right to the outfielders. He's had a few plays that should have been hits, but nope, instead it's a running catch or a catch leaping at the wall. He's had two home runs get stolen that way. Thankfully, Lions had the last laugh one time against Quincy College, yeah. hit uh, responding with a solo shot back during a thrilling 11-10 loss for the Spartans with home runs galore. And you could tell with that last swing, he's definitely trying to swing for the fences here to ensure... They make an increase in that lead. Here is the 1-1, one, one, a count 1-2 and two as he swings and misses. Lions the 1-2. Ball outside. Count 2-2. Two and two. Save for Lions. He is a player that knows how to put the ball in play. Only one strikeout throughout the entire season in 20 at-bats. And he's also recorded two walks alongside it. A 2-to-1 strikeout walk ratio is great. The 2-2. Two -two. Mets to Mount Masha. Down to Tronson to get the 4-6-3 double play. So the Tampa Spartans now down with two outs. Bases are now cleared. We have Danny Gutcha now to the plate. Gutch on the night, 0 for 2, still trying to get some contact here. It would have been nice to have at least a base runner on the plate to get some momentum going, but now he will have to create the momentum for himself as the, we now have two outs here in the bottom of the seventh. I'll say tough for Lions there, but I also think in a play like that, it can be pretty demoralizing when you hit a weak rounder to short, but you have to try to run it out. Although, you know, Lions, he also had an injury when he was trying to run out a play earlier. Maybe he was just trying to make sure he didn't hurt his ankle again on that play before. But I know Coach Urso might not be the happiest to see Lions not going extremely fast to first base Oof. on that previous grounder. So this one ooh, bounces, bounces weirdly swings off of Milik. That's where you get fooled by a 55-mile-an-hour curveball. Yeah. And the first pitch was a breaking ball inside for a strike. So now he faces 0-2 with two outs. Tampa Spartans lead 1-0 after the Panthers concede the error. But here is the 0-2. 
grounder foul. Ranovich 0 2. High count now 1 and 2. He was kind of wishing he jumped on that. You know, a lot, I would say if a, if a left handed batter was there, he would definitely probably would have jumped on it because it's very, very known for or prone for left handers to hit, get that high pitch. Strike 3 looking, and Gutcha is frustrated at himself as he walks back to the dugout to end the inning. So, no, no runs. No man left on base. We go to the top of the eighth. You are watching TampaSports.tv. The nine, one, and two hitters are due up for Davenport. Taylor Storthy back with Brandon Davis, top of the eighth inning. It's going to be Brodsky taking them out for the Spartans. He's had a great job in his bullpen appearances so far. Three and a third with three strikeouts and one walk. Hasn't conceded a run. Held opponents to a 154 batting average. Overall, the Spartans uh, pitching staff holds runners to about the Mendoza line at 213. We'll have to wait and see how this inning goes. Heilich leads off. He's had a solid plate game behind home plate. Keeping in front of balls with good blocking and also catching a few runners stealing with a strong arm. We'll see if Heilich can try to find a second hit as the comeback train is looking to continue. I'll say personally, I was surprised not to see the number 32 entering the game here. But I will note, I think he's going back to warm up with a catcher. They might bring him on for the final inning, potentially. Or if Brodsky gets in any trouble. I haven't seen him got in, in any trouble yet this season, so don't think that would likely be an issue for him. Oh, and one taken and swung on and missed. 8.51 p.m. still Feely nice out. Don't have a lot of long sleeve shirts outside. It's beautiful weather. Even as we get further into the night. <laughs> Taylor, you flinched on that one like you previously mentioned. No oh, and foul two. Tip. Indeed. Oh, and two. On deck will be Valone and Rubner. Combined, those two are 0 for 6 today. This one's going to be grounded hard to Urso. Makes the grab and. Ooh, that is not good. The runner will be safe, but there was a collision there. And what I think what happened is that the ball hit him as Dosco couldn't grab it. Oh, you hate to see it.
half a million college athletes a path to go pro in something other than sports. Learn more at NCAA.org slash opportunity. And we are back, and the good news is, is Heilich was treated. There was a big round of applause. I believe he's actually still going to be in the game. I'm not sure if they actually brought in a pinch runner. They may have done that. We'll have to see if SAP broadcast updates. But for now, Valone will go with a runner on, and yet just on the previous play, very unlucky, the throw from Urso, aiming for Dosco, and it it did hit Heilick as he was getting to first base. And I believe Heilick is still at first base, so he will ride it out. Commence to him. So we'll get the full confirmation if that is still Heilick there, but I will say glad to see him get up after that. Any type of head injury is scary. Batters wear helmets, but they aren't always perfect in protecting, and from what it clearly looked like on that play, it must have missed at least the majority of the helmet or hit the helmet hard enough to cause him to be down for a second. It's now 2-0 as Valoni was trying to drop the bunt, and he still is. This one's actually high for ball three. We see Nunez running all the way in to try to pick up the bunt. Brodsky just needs to find the zone, I think. Let him put it down. Let the fielders do the work. Yeah. I think a smart move to try to play small ball when you need just one run. 3-0 here to Valone. And Valone is actually going to get ball four here. Undoubtedly, Nelson warming up. I do not think that Urso would hesitate to make that call if we see the bases get loaded. Well, he's consulting with his pitching coach as we speak right now. So we'll get some more details on that for you guys. But and by the way, here comes Militello. He is actually going to come out to the mound. While Urso definitely trusts Brodsky in a tough game like this, knowing that Nelson will have four days of rest, so you have a blank check to use him, there will be no reason uh, to not bring in Nelson if things get tough. And personally, now I'm not, of course, anywhere near as experienced as Coach Urso, so take what I say with a grain of salt, but I think a better move could have been to bring in Nelson here but Brodsky's also had a great start to the season. And What's your reason for Nelson to come in instead of Brodsky? What's your reason? Well, because he's had a great start. He's had three strikeouts, only one walk, conceded two hits, and through three and a third, hadn't conceded a run. He's first on the leaderboard for leading an ERA for the Spartans. Very active, doing a good job. So I definitely see why Urso wanted to give him another opportunity. But just a little rocky start. I think Militello here maybe just trying to get Brodsky back in the right direction. But... In a close game like this, it would be unfair to Brodsky, potentially, but to play for the win, you maybe do prompt an emergency change. But Brodsky has a chance to battle back against Rubner, who's still 0 for 3 with two consecutive strikeouts. Mm. Certainly wants to correct that. Two strikes on, on him. Now he has the one last chance for the, strike, for, the, for the third at bat. Excuse me, fourth at bat. Two straight strikeouts. Does not want to get a third consecutive one. The good news is, at least for Rumner's case, I have a feeling he's not going to be trying for swings. I think he's going to bunt and advance the runners again. That's why you see Nunez already playing very shallow. Dosca playing pretty shallow. Here's the first pitch. And this time, strike one finds it over the heart of the plate. Until two strikes, Rumner will definitely be dropping those bunts or attempting to. Pulls it back just in time, one at one. By the way, Metz is on deck as well, and he's a pretty dangerous hitter, so yeah. you definitely would like a situation with runners in scoring position for him. The bunt goes foul. And so now, it's a big risk if you bunt with Rumner because a foul bunt would be strike three. Interesting, yeah. Kind of sound like Will Buxton in Drive to Survive overstating those simple facts <laughs> about the game. But let's see what happens with the 1-2. Rumner will go for the bunt, and that is out number one. Wow, I think, like you said, it's kind of foolish on that one, but... 
Nevertheless, he will go back to the dugout, and they will have another opportunity with Mets to come up. As you previously mentioned, he is a very dangerous threat. This is dangerous territory as Brodsky is stepping into with one man in sc on scoring position. But nevertheless, he can, Brett, Mets can move up both of these batters with a sack fly if it goes to deep right or if it's a bunt to advance the runners. Unfortunately for Brodsky, he's not going to have that chance. Urso is going to bring in the fireman. I guarantee you that this will be Braden Nelson coming in from the bullpen. So if Brodsky was able to get the out, I think Urso is going to say, listen, he's hitting 400 on the year. I'm trying to be safe than sorry. Good job to get the out on the previous bunt, though. So Brodsky is responsible for the runners. His day will end earlier than I know he was hoping for, but we'll see Brodsky later this season, and I'm sure he'll be back to red-hot form. It's a high-leverage call, and there's only one man for the job for Coach Urso. It's Braden Nelson. We'll be right back as Braden Nelson warms up. For college sports. There's light at the end of the tunnel. A return to normal and all we love about sports. You've instilled resilience, focus, and selflessness in us. We've put those lessons to work. We've found strength and unity in each other. You continue to take us places we never imagined. You bring out the best in us. So when we look forward, we see the light at the end of the tunnel. We see a better world for all of us. And, and for college sports. sports. Braden Nelson in the game. And I will say, he is definitely the best pitcher in the pitching staff, period, for the Spartans. Dominant last year from the bullpen. Even proven that he can go five to six innings if you want him to. A very versatile guy, an absolutely deadly slider, deadly fastball. No major weaknesses in his game, with the exception of that 321-foot foul pole that one of the Georgia College hitters took him deep on early in the year. All six runs of his came off home runs. Wow. One of them came in an unlucky bases loaded spot against Quincy College. That was also then followed up with a back to back shot in one of Nelson's roughest career outings. But even before that, he was getting strikeouts easy peasy. 14 strikeouts to two walks this season. Those 14 strikeouts have come in 10 innings of play. So, really good stuff for Nelson and undoubtedly the man you want to have on the mound in a high leverage spot like this. In fact, he is up there with some of the starters for the Spartans. Beckett, uh, Eli Thurman has pitched 21 and a third through four full games with 16 strikeouts. Bray Nelson's only had 10 innings and he's only two strikeouts behind. So Mets against Nelson, a huge batting and pitching battle right here. You mentioned that 10 inning difference. Nelson's only conceded one more hit than Eric Thurman. It's astonishing. That, I think, is a big uh, stat that Thurman actually succeeds with more, with the fewer hits through those innings. I think it's more bad luck, unfortunately, for Nelson. This one just goes high. It's a 2-0 count now for Mets. Runner goes. Throw from Gutcher. And in time, they get the out. Actually, no, he's safe. no, he's calling safe. It looked very weird from this angle because the, um, the umpire is at a 90-degree perpendicular angle to the camera, so when he motions to safe, it's really hard to tell whether it's out or not. It even looked like he made one motion and changed it. But, indeed, Hylek is safe. Valone also advances. 2-1 count. Runners at second and third. Infield, I think, playing deep. Chess that slider man. getting into the zone, strike two. Very close throw there from Gutcher, but I think just a step too late, or maybe a full hand length too late. Gutcher gets on top of it. Would have been disaster if it went wild. Full count now for Mets. Heilig had to dive back to third base <laughs> as he was ready to go home. A little bit uh, too jumpy there. But there was not enough time for Gutcher to get it to Nunez and make him pay. It seemed like the ball got, kind of got stuck in his hand. Nelson, just for a little bit too long. Here's the 3 2 to Mets. This one ripped to center field. All the way back is Cadenas. It's caught, and we will have a tie game with two away. 
The stolen base put Heilich in position, and the sack fly has put the game tied at one with the go-ahead run still on second. Showers steps up to the plate with two away. He has a chance to try to take the lead, but that's easier said than done against Nelson. That was a very well-hit ball, though, from Mets. Yes, a very, very interesting turn of events. Taken, and Gutcher tried to frame it. Doesn't get the call. It's 1-0. This one, did he go? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. One and one. That was tough because it was a very close fastball, but of the sweet chin music we mentioned earlier. But he did go further around, so it's a one-one count. Nelson, with what looked to be a two-seamer, just can't find the zone. It's two and one. This one's taken. It's two and two. The pressure is on. Here's the two two from the stretch. This one sent down the line and very far foul. Over to the empty bullpen for Davenport. Now a two two count with a runner on second and two away. Two runs scored in total, so a lot of twos on the stat sheet. Runner goes. This one's grounded over to Dosko, and the throw to Nelson is made, so Dosko gets, helps get out of the jam, but unfortunately for the Spartans, Davenport does find a run. Bottom of the eighth coming up, Saladino, Cadenas, Combo, pending any pinch hitters, will be due up. Champions know how to seize opportunities. When they see moments of greatness unfold right before their eyes, they push as hard as they possibly can. And then they push harder. Because the heart of a champion never settles, never quits, and never stops giving its all. We are champions. We are Division II. We go big, we give it everything we've got, and we win. On the field, on our campuses, in our communities, for our causes, in our careers. We rise to become champions in everything we do. We are Division II and there are no limits here. We make our time count. We set our own path. We become champions on our terms. It's time to up your game because we're here to play and learn. But most importantly, we're here to discover ourselves, our vision, our heart, our drive to achieve every goal we aim for because we want to be champions at the highest level life at division two the opportunities are here are you ready bottom half of the eighth here we are tied at one and one if you guys are just missing it the top of the eighth as saladino takes a strike for the first strike saladino excuse me the Panthers scored off a sack fly by Mets, scoring in Hilek, and now the Panthers level it 1-1 here in the bottom of the eighth. Pitch is low for a count 1-1. One one. Going to be tough for the Spartans here. They've got the 8-9-1 hitters up. They're going to want to get the heart of the Spartans order up with potentially dangerous runners. It'll be up to Saladino and Cadenas to try to set it up for Combo and the rest of the gang. Swing and a miss, Saladino, strike two. Say so it's tricky for Saladino, he's a lefty against a lefty. That's where the platoon advantage really benefits Davenport and Vandevitt. Yes, of course. <laughs> Certainly abnormal for left-handed batters. Here's the one-two, swing and a miss. Saladino goes down swinging for the first out. So now Jose Cadenas comes up. Jose Cadenas and Saladino combined 0 for 4 on the night. Cadenas trying to get something going here as he is the last batter in the lineup. 
Both Cadenas and Saladino entering the bat had four ground outs to the second baseman, which is incredibly bad luck. But I know Saladino, uh, that Cadenas wants to break that trend and get on base here. Well, he's definitely yearning to get on base as his speed is definitely needed. He takes the first strike, count all one. Hard to tell whether that was uh, just a fastball or maybe potentially a low slider just getting think, into that low corner. I think you might be right with the low slider, Taylor. Pitch is high outside. Count oh. one and one. One of the most dangerous things to deal with is a left-handed two-seam fastball. It is a <laughs> very abnormal movement. What handedness did you use when you were hitting? I, excuse me. Foul tip by Saladino. Excuse me, can you say that question again? Which uh, side did you hit off of, right or left? Oh, I was fully lefty. Oh, fully lefty. Fully oh, lefty. yeah. So yeah, that's lefty. so you know like well that those sinkers are really yeah. tough to battle with. Yeah. But I will say for a short stint in my life, I would say for about a year, I did go switch hitting. I tried out righty, but you know, I'm genetically I'm just a lefty. Pitch is hit is down to center field. Valone is there to get the out. A routine fly out was a relatively more of a line out, and Valone gets it for the second out of the inning. We have EJ Combo, top of the lineup here. Combo, a great outing tonight, three for three. Two singles and a double. I'll say Hopefully he can get something going here for the Spartans as they definitely do need him now as they tie. And they will go down for the next at bat for the bottom of the ninth. Hoping to end it in the top of the ninth, but they will now have to bat again. Here is the first pitch. Grounder lined up the middle for a base hit. EJ Combo gets on base. So he was four for four in the night, Taylor. Fourth hit of the night for Combo. Continuing his great night. And that'll start to get the heart of the order up. Erhard, Urso, Nunez could get some chances. Nunez would be hitting from the right side of the plate because he is a switch hitter. But for now, Erhard in a very high leverage spot. They'd like to give the Spartans a chance to win in the top of the ninth. But Davenport would very much like to at least try to take it to the bottom of the ninth. And in the top, give themselves a chance to win. We will see. There's the first pitch. Lined out to the right, and he gets the play. A great play by Rubner to close out the inning. So no runs, one hit, one man left on base, and we go to the top of the ninth here. You are watching TampaSpawns.tv. And we are back at the University of Tampa Stadium. Braden Nelson. He needs to keep it quiet in the top of the ninth inning. As we have a tied game, we could go to extra innings again for the Spartans. By the way, the Spartans have had good luck in extra innings. They won both games that they've had in extra innings so far this season, which were a 2-1 win against Georgia College and a 5-3 win on back-to-back -back days. Leaning off is going to be Robinson, singled back in the second, but hasn't found any hits since. That time, a devilish two-seam, putting it to a 1-1 count. Nelson was brought in to try to get out of a jam in the eighth. He ultimately was able to keep the damage to one after a sacrifice fly. Swung on and missed. One and two here for Nelson. Yeah. 
And he's got him. Two straight swings and misses to get his first strike out of the game. And the first out of the top of the ninth. In Davenport, I know, be looking a little nervously at the do-up batters for the Spartans, Urso, Nunez, and Dosko. All three really good hitters. But for now, Davenport does have a chance to try to give the Spartans some extra work to do. Johnson, who's one for three with a hit back in the seventh, is ready to go. By the way, the current line stats, one run and seven hits and one error for the Spartans. One run, five hits, one error for Davenport. Just high, the count goes one and one. This one fouled away. And that one just lands in front of the dugout back onto the field. Taken low, and Gutcher thought he had it. Or maybe he's just calling that, calling the wrong pitch out. But either way, they're ready to go once again for the 2-2. Two -two. This one fouled away. And Brandon, Davenport's been able to battle a lot in these at-bats. Yeah, and that, that wasn't really, we didn't really see that early on. We've seen them got on, got on the base more, but now you're seeing the, the resilience that they have now. And did he go? No, he didn't. But, yeah, you're seeing this now because there's more urgency. I believe the coach definitely did instill that into them, their mindsets now. And they're, they're leading. I mean, they're not leading, but they could have a chance to lead in the top of the ninth. Here's the 3-2. Swung on and missed another strikeout for Nelson. And I will say, well, it is good to try to get a reliever's pitch count up. Nelson's gone plenty of innings before. We know he's good through 40-plus pitches, so there's no sweat if he has a couple long at-bats in one of his innings. You know, he can go three or potentially even four if Coach Erso needs him to. However, he works so well as a reliever, there's no way that Erso would really trust him in a starting rotation unless it was a must-win playoff game. That one in the dirt ball won. Sharadorov. One strikeout and 0 for 3 today. He's grounded a few times out over to EJ Dosko. We'll see if he's going to have another ball headed his way here. One and one on the swing and miss. For the Spartans, they'll be next on the road at Mississippi College. That'll be a fun weekend series. So this one's fouled away. And of course, the Spartans will be back next week, Monday, against Seton Hill at 3 p.m. And then they'll have a weekend series at the end of Tampa's March break, which comes at a weirder time than some of the other colleges down here in Florida. That one's in the dirt, two and two. That's when you can catch another Sunshine State Conference showdown as the Spartans take on Embry-Riddle. And actually, I believe Davenport actually faces Embry-Riddle too coming up. They actually faced them March 1st, Wednesday, March 1st at 6 p.m. That'll be an interesting game to see. They'll be on the road against the Aeronautical Engineers. And the Eagles as well. 3-2. Swung on and missed. It took a few full counts, but Nelson strikes out the side. Spartans have a chance to win it in the bottom of the ninth. We'll be back with more after this.
We are live back here in Tampa, Florida. Thank you guys for joining TampaSpons.tv. We're here in the bottom of the ninth. The both teams still tied here, one and one. We will, the Tampa Spons, they will have an opportunity in the potential last at bat to win the game with Urso up. You have Nunez next, and you have Daskal at the third lineup. So here is JD Urso. Urso on the night, one for two. Let's see if he can set the tone for the Spartans and potentially win the, the game. Brandon, I know you uh, had hypothesized that early in the game this could be a pitcher's duel, and you were right. It's turned out exactly to be that. Great pitching on display for both teams. So real baseball fans, they love to see this. Count is 1-0 with the high pitch. But, yeah, back to what I was saying. Yeah, this is a very, very, very good duel. It's, I, I'm very tuned in. Strike right down the middle, count one and one. Urso grounded into a double play last time. It also counted to bring a run home to give the Spartans what was a 1-0 lead that sadly did not last all the way. But Urso has a chance to try to help the Spartans get back here. Here's the pitch. Swing and a miss. The ball the bat goes down to the dugout. Flies all the way to the dugout. <laughs> J.D. Urso, definitely apologetic on that one, but a comical thing could have been very scary for one of his teammates as he goes down swinging for the first out. You saw three or four of the uh, oh, teammates. Excuse me. Excuse me. He, will, he gets another one. But he will get another bat for another at bat. It was off camera because we can't cover all of the dugouts on this camera, but a few of the Spartan teammates had to run out of the dugout to avoid the errant bat. That's when you're trying to hit the ball, and sometimes you're thinking about letting go a little too early. So Ursa with a new bat, but not a new pitch count. Here is the one two. Outside count two and two. Definitely you could see he's very, very urgent to get a hit. Set the tone for the for the Spartans, but he has to maintain grip. Swing and a miss. Bat flies again. <laughs> but nevertheless, it did not hit nobody this time, but J.D. Urso goes down swinging, definitely in frustration. I've never seen that in my life, ever, having the bat swing and fly twice in a one at bat. But that was, uh, I'm just happy nobody got hurt on that one. Nobody got hurt on that one. Yeah, just definitely a little I couldn't see on the camera. scary series of events there, and we actually yeah. saw uh, Drew Earhart tumble over Alex Caney uh, running out of the dugout there, but they're both fine. Here is Anthony Nunez. The first out, he is up to the plate. Here's the pitch. Grounder, right to Marsha. He fields it to Tronson to get the second out of the inning. So here's Daskal. Two outs. Left in the bottom of the ninth. Still 1-1 one, one here. Unfortunately, both teams did concede one run, one error. Tampa Spartans have at least two more hits. But they do still have an opportunity here to change the course. Whoa, that is hit deep to left field. At the track. Whoa, see ya. EJ Daskal gets the walk off for the Tampa Spartans. And they now go up 10, 11 to 2. What a walk off from EJ Daskal. You are witnessing greatness here, ladies and gentlemen. The Tampa Spartans go out in fashion as they win 2-1. to one. Wow. I think some of the Davenport fans were hoping for free baseball. Dosco said, not so fast, <laughs> my friend. A moonshot into the night sky. And the Spartans, as you mentioned, will get their 11th W of the campaign for Davenport. It's wow. a heartbreaking loss for the second game in a row. They lost 11-10. They lose 2-1. But hey, they did a great job against the Spartans. We wish them the best of their luck as they continue their Florida tour down south. And yes, the Tampa Spartans, as you previously mentioned, their next game will be against Mississippi College. That will be a three-game series starting in, in, in Friday. It will go and conclude on Sunday. But here, nevertheless, you have the Tampa Spartans winning it in nice fashion with a walk-off to deep left. EJ Daskal delivers for his team. You will see the Panthers 
They will, next game will be the, concluding the month, February 28th, 5.30 against Ganyan University. That will be in Davenport, Florida. And the next game will be against MB Riddle. So if you guys are definitely fans of them, definitely tune into that one. But nevertheless here, there are no words left to say. We are here speechless, but it was definitely a very eventful Monday night. That's the best we can say. I'm here live from Tampa, Florida. This is Brendan Davis and Taylor Stoltzworthy. You are watching TampaSwans.tv.